This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello, and welcome to this afternoon's Sunset Safari, where we're about to take you to see all sorts of amazing things. But before we get started, you'll notice that I'm speaking very softly. I've got a funny feeling that this female impala might just be about to give birth. And the poor thing's looking really thin and undernourished. But first, let us get the introductions. Oh, hold on. Just want to see her. No, she doesn't look like she's got any sign of water breaking. Shame, she is so thin. Poor thing. A very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Senzo is on camera with me and a special warm welcome to the students joining us from Glenwood Elementary. It's wonderful to have you on safari. Remember basically this is a live safari where you can pretend that you're on the back of the safari vehicle with us. So imagine it's quite cold, it smells like rain, it's a cloudy day, you'll notice that there's a pole in the way every now and again. That's because we've got a roof on the vehicle to keep our equipment and ourselves dry. For the rest of you, please continue to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or alternatively in the YouTube comments section. Now, if you're wondering where it is we are, we're in a place called Juma Private Game Reserve, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Now, what I wanted to do was take you to go and see some lions. I want to go and see if we can find them. I even heard them roaring just a few minutes ago. But before we do, I just want to take one last look at this impala. Now you will notice that she looked very, very thin. Her hip bones were sticking out, her spine was sticking out. And that's because it's the dry season here in South Africa, or at least this part of South Africa. So we don't really have four seasons. We don't have spring and summer and autumn and winter. We have a dry season and a wet season. And the dry season is when it's very cold. But as we come now into our summer months, it gets a lot hotter, but the rain hasn't started to fall yet. So I said that it's raining, but it's not really. So you'll notice the bush is very dry and brown and there's not much for these animals to eat. So for Impala, like this female, she's hiding now. Impala, like this female, she has got to be able to keep herself fed as well as her baby. Hello, hello, and welcome to Dominique. Now, Dominique would like to know if it's possible to tame the animals. Dominique, it could potentially be possible to get the animals used to people, and that's in a way what's been done because the lions and the leopards and the elephants are all very used to having people move around in a vehicle around them. But that's all we ever do because wild animals belong in the wild and they don't need to be tamed by humans. First of all, it's dangerous for humans because they never are fully tame. They're not domesticated like cats or dogs, so they can be quite dangerous. But even more important than that, wild animals belong in the wild. They don't want the company of humans. They don't seek out the company of humans. Shame, poor girl. She is very hungry. So anywhere that you find that someone perhaps has a wild animal as a pet, or maybe there's a place that you can go where they let you touch lion cubs or play with lion cubs or tiger cubs, think very carefully about the way that these animals live. These way that these animals live. Now you've got, perhaps you've got cats or dogs at home and you love them very much and they love you because for thousands of years people have kept those animals as pets and over the years they have become completely dependent upon human beings. We don't need any more animals than that. We've got dogs and cats and horses. We don't need to keep wild animals as pets. But as you said, it, or as I said before, it is possible for us to get them to be relaxed around us and around the vehicle because they don't see us as a threat in any way. And that is very important to remember. Now, I actually thought that perhaps this impala was giving birth because the pregnancy is lying so low in her stomach. Her stomach's right bulging down. So I thought perhaps 
there was a chance that she was going to have her baby. And that will be really helpful for her because then at least she's got the baby. She's not having to carry that extra weight around with her while she struggles to find food. But it doesn't look as though this baby is ready to come out yet. Now she's moving into some dense vegetation. I don't want to startle her. So I said that they're used to vehicles. But antelope, especially if you sometimes if you spend too long watching them, they start to get a bit edgy and uncomfortable, wondering why you're paying so much attention to them. Now normally that's okay. You can sit with a herd of animals and they, they get used to you. But for a female like this who's going through such a difficult time right now, I don't want to push too close or too much more. So we'll just take one last look at her. And we'll have to wish her all the best. Good luck, girl. Brave, brave animal. Now, I mentioned that we drive around looking for animals, but we also try and creep up to them on foot, which is what Sydney's going to be doing this afternoon. You can see that here we have got some of the droppings from some of the animals. These droppings, they are looking very much big. It is from the buffaloes. A very, very good afternoon, boys and girls. I am Sydney from Mulani Mikosi, and I'm going to be your guide this afternoon together with my operator, uh, my camera operator, Sebastian. My game scout is uh, Rexen. So we will try by all means and get you all these interesting animals. So for in case, if you need our attention, you can ask your teachers to send us questions on uh, uh, you can ask your teachers to send us questions on YouTube, hashtag Safari Live. So this... Say, we have got two different of safaris at the moment. We've got the vehicles and we are doing it on foot. And on foot is interesting because we are the ones who are getting a close contact with the animals than the people driving. We also see things that people don't see when they're driving. So here where I am, I'm going to see from the tiny little insects to the, ins to the big animals. And big animals, to us, it will be just like bonus. Amazing lovely to be very close to this nature. Uh, Giovanni, South Africa as a country has got about a, a lot of different biomes. And here where I am, I am by the low field, which is part of the savanna biome. So the vegetation type here where I am is not that very thick. It's much more open. It's big trees, but consisted with quite a lot of grass. We have got grassland biomes as well, which is just grass everywhere and less trees. So here where I am is a mixture of both grass and trees. So you can see these are some of the trees we have got. And if you check now, there's a big difference between this tree and the tree on the background. So the tree on the background doesn't have the leaves at all. And this one here has got green leaves. This is one of the evergreen trees. All year round, this tree has got the green leaves. But the other ones, when this dry season comes, dry season is a winter season. You will see them starting to lose the leaves. When they drop the leaves, then they become dry. And the animal who stays there, such as the birds, they have got a lot of problems because they cannot hide anymore. That is why some of these birds can leave this area where I am to overseas because there is no enough shelter for them to hide in order to avoid predation. Predation is when other big birds are eating the small birds. So now uh, let's go to the Masai Mara and see one of the biggest reptiles, the crocodile. Good afternoon to you all. Welcome to Safari Live Sunset Safari. My name is Oli. Joining us behind the camera is Bongai. We are coming to you live from 
Mara Triangle in Kenya. Look what we have for you this afternoon. A very big crocodile, I think is about two and a half meters. If I had a tape measure, I would run there and measure the crocodile. But it's not safe. Don't ever, ever try that. What the crocodile is doing now is uh, just basking on the sunlight, generating some body heat because we know crocodiles are cold-blooded animals. Oh, the teeth show me its teeth. I won't come there and brush you. You're gonna kill me with immediate effect. They open their mouth because they are trying to cool their body. Yes, my dear, there are other water animals. There's a hippo. If let's see, we can find some hippos. Yes, we can see hippos just a little bit of oh, it's submerged. They do this because their skin is sensitive from heat, so they spend the whole day in the water. They will only come out in the evening to go and graze. They can submerge for four to six minutes, only the adults, and the young ones they will submerge from a minute to two. What is happening here, it's so amazing because crocodiles they are meat eaters, hippos are grass eaters, but they share, they share this beautiful territory which is water. A crocodile can attack baby hippos if left unattended, but a crocodile know its space and where to swim and when not to swim. And what happened here, it, it's amazing because before we were here, we heard that there was a uh, migration going on, but because of this crocodile, those zebras walked away. They were disturbed by this crocodile here. I can, couldn't get the question clear, can you please repeat the question? These crocodiles can grow up to all oh, here it opens its mouth again it's cooling its body that's what it does normally during the hot of during the hot days like this it can weigh up to a ton but looking at this one right now I think it's less than a ton I'm wishing and I'm hoping to see a bigger crocodile than this one because there's a lot of crocodile I've seen since I'm, I'm here but we can only see one. We saw about 10 crocodiles, big ones. Let's leave our crocodiles while they are busy generating heat from the sunlight and go to Brent with their wild dogs. Ah, Tony. I hope you know, never smile at a crocodile. Yes, thanks very much, Tolly. I hope you're enjoying the Mara. Yes, we are on our way to where we, we found the wild dogs this morning when I was out with the trainees, but unfortunately they were in an area that was not great for signal, so no one came there. And uh, we are making our way towards where I left them. But on our way, we're just checking up around little Tlalamba, around Lion Tree Road is our backup plan. But good afternoon, my name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Batman on camera. And hashtag Brent has escaped the tent is what's trending at the moment because I have escaped from the tent. And, uh, and nice to have all the schools with us. And I hope you have lots of questions. I want to hear lots of questions. And I've got a question for you off the bat. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to answer Alexis's question first. 
to which is how can I live in Africa with all the animals? Very happily is my answer, Alexis. I love living out in the bush with all the animals. I'm very lucky. I've been living in the bush since I was very small, so I've grown up in game reserves. So it is a, I'm very, very lucky that way. Now, we had a little female leopard around here yesterday, so I'm hoping she's still about, and then I'm gonna go look for wild dogs. I uh, see, here. Yeah, there's some off-road tracks. But uh, I've got a question for you all out there who can tell me if a wild dog what is different from uh, from a wild dog compared to a wolf what is the difference between a wild dog and a wolf i'll be very very impressed if any of you guys can get that so there we go think about it think carefully what is the difference between a wild dog and a wolf And uh, she was hiding around here yesterday. Oh, Devon would like to know how many animals live here. <gasps> lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, Devon, um, in terms of numbers. But in terms of species, we can run through a few of them with you. And uh, we think about the big ones. We've got elephant, buffalo, rhino, lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog, hyena, uh, impala, hippopotamus, warthog, lots of different types of mongoose, so lots of different types of animals live here at Devon. But I'd say the most common animal and the most widely spread animal is the impala and I'm sure we're going to see an impala soon somewhere, one of us will see an impala. Okay. No sign of the little leopard where she was yesterday. I might have to come back and check this area again a little bit later. She might be hiding in a thicket because it is quite chilly today. Chris would like to know what is the most vicious and hardest animal to find? Hmm. That's a difficult question, Chris. Um, I'd say probably a honey badger, yes, that's what I was thinking. But you must, oh, there's an impala that we were talking about. Let me just go forward for Craig so he can show it to you so there's no. Here we go. So that is the most numerous antelope. It is an impala. Oh, apparently Jamie has already showed you one. And you can see they're all fluffy because it's cold. So they r raise their hair and they trap air between their body and their hair and it makes an insulative blanket. So even animals out in the bush can have special adaptations to warm up when it's a chilly. Okay, no sign of the leopard. I'm going to go look for the wild dogs. So I'm going to give you a clue to what is the difference between a wolf and a wild dog. It's got something to do with their teeth. And of course the fact that we don't get wolves in southern Africa. We do get w wolf species in East Africa. Uh, and in North Africa, but none here. But quickly across to Sydney, who's got a hippo who's out the water. So I have got the hippopotamus on foot. Uh, he's just here behind me and he's very much relaxed. The hippopotamus normally by this time of the day is when they are by the water holes. They only come out at night looking for the grazing purpose. So grazing it's about feeding on grass. So these kind of big animals, they feed on grass. And early in the mornings, they go back to the water again. So they can do both water and terrestrial life. Terrestrial life, it means animals occurring on the ground. So the hippopotamus is so big because this is the third, uh, this this is the third largest animal here in Africa. The elephant is the largest, and then you've got the hippopot, you got the rhino, and come the hippopotamus.
he's got some birds there just that I'm not too sure if you can see them right next to the between the mouth and the front legs those are the oxpackers the oxpackers are responsible to clean these animals there is a very good relationship between the birds and the big animals so the animals are being cleaned the parasites parasites are the small uh, 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 the small kind of mites which bite these animals, ticks which bite these animals, and these birds they are taking the the the, the parasite and eat them as food. So at the end, the animal is being cleaned. So this animal is so very stationary. Rich, the hippopotamus are grazers. They are herbivores. Herbivores are the animals feeding on vegetation. But they don't eat the leaves from the trees. They only eat grass. So at the moment, this hippopotamus is very relaxed. But if you find them outside the water, sometimes they can give you problems. They will chase you. They always want a good distance between you and them. So surely he's going to go uh, to the nearest water hole, but not now, maybe uh, after dark. So now we are going to leave him because we don't want to disturb him. This is such a very big animal. This is a very big animal. If we disturb, me, disturb him, he's going to give us problems. So we are just going to slowly move away. So now let's go to Jamie by the Buffalo Zook Dam. So we've arrived at Buffles Hook Dam. Now this is where the lions were earlier this morning. Now Buffles Hook means Buffalo Corner in Afrikaans, which is one of South Africa's national languages. So this is Buffles Hook, Buffalo Corner, and it is one of the only water holes with any water left in it. And look, it's got an inhabitant that is taking advantage of that fact. So that amazingly beautiful bird is called a saddle build stalk so saddle you know like a saddle of a horse that you put on a horse so you can ride it that's why it's called a saddle build stalk because it looks like it's got a saddle on it and the fact that it has yellow eyes tells me immediately that it is a female saddle build stalk because the males don't have yellow eyes like that now just hold on one moment I'm just going to have to move which is going to be a bit difficult because I don't have any brakes. But just bear with me. Hang on one moment. We're going to go backwards. Hopefully not off the wall, into the water. That would be very sad. Whoa. No brakes, no brakes. Whee! Okay, I'm going to give you a different view of the saddle build stalk. Ah, now while we watch the saddle build stalk and we talk about dried up water holes, oh dear, I've put the pole right in the way, but let's see if Senzo can get it. Hi, Jan, how are, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you doing? Good. Okay, so Lillian, the bird's gone behind the pole. Let me move. Lillian, you want to know about the climate here. So, I mentioned that there is a dry season and a wet season. Now in the dry season the temperatures never get super super cold. So you're looking at, there we go, now we can see it again. Let me duck out of your way. You're looking at temperatures of around about, mm, it goes right down to 39 degrees Fahrenheit, 38, 39 degrees Fahrenheit most mornings. But then the afternoons are actually quite hot, so around about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, 
In summer, it's a very, very different story in our wet season. So it goes super, super hot, often over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's when we get our rain in the form mostly of thunderstorms. Now, you are only looking at a rain of around about... Mm, probably 400 to 500 milliliters a year. So it's quite a dry place. This is quite a dry savanna. But this year, or the last three years, have been very, very dry. We haven't had as much rain as we usually get. And that's why, even when we've had the wet seasons, that's why the water holes haven't had a chance to recover each year. So that at the moment, what that saddle build stalk is doing is searching the dried mud cracks. Marie, you want to know if there are cities in Africa? Marie, we do indeed have cities in Africa. Do you know that we even have McDonald's in certain African countries? So we have cities with lots and lots of people. Johannesburg, which is one of the biggest cities in South Africa, has close on 9 million people. That we have big buildings, big apartment blocks, all sorts of things. So, yes, we do have cities indeed. Now, most of the time, you'll see in, in the world, big cities are on rivers. Now, Johannesburg is one of the big, big cities in South Africa that isn't on a river. And the reason that it's there is because that's where they discovered gold. So people started rushing there. But there's cities, remember, Africa's an enormous place. So Africa is a, made up of a whole load of different countries. We're in South Africa, which is one of the bigger countries in the Af on the African continent right down at the southern corner you um, have also been to Kenya which is a slightly smaller country right up in the sort of eastern central side of the African continent so yes we do have cities but right now we're not sitting in one our closest city is Hutzbreit I don't think we'd call it a city I think we'd call it a town but that's our closest place to here there's cinemas there's restaurants there's cars and buses and trains and and all sorts of things so yes we do have cities here in Africa some are bigger some are smaller but there's lots of them this of course comes as a relief to most of the of the African population now I'm going to move on and I'm going to see if I can find this lion there were two lions, and not only were there two lions here this morning, there was also a leopard. Now, they chased the poor leopard away, and they stole his food, which is very rude. But that is what all predators will do. Okay, we've got one nice, really, really nice look at this bird, so we'll stop here. And we can look at it since the car up ahead of us has stopped. We can stop and look at the bird, and we can t answer Madison's question about how it is that lions find their prey. Well, lions have a very good sense of hearing and a very good sense of smell, but they also can see very well, especially in the dark. They can see better than we can in the dark. So what they'll do is they'll walk around and they will, sometimes they'll follow the sound of buffalo or maybe they'll hear a big antelope moving in the distance and they will creep up, up on it and they will hunt it and they will kill it and that is how lions find their food but sometimes they sniff out the food of other animals like the leopard this morning and they steal it from them so they scavenge so it's not just uh, hyenas that scavenge out here there's also lions that like to scavenge now this stork isn't scavenging this stork is actively hunting for frogs and small animals called terrapins that look kind of like turtles but they can move between water and land and they've got clawed feet so they don't have flippers they have feet so that's what the stork is looking for the storks actually had quite a bad day recently because there's been hyenas around there's been lions there's been a leopard but still they're all gone and the stork has stayed. I wonder where her friend went. There was a male here the past few days, but he appears to have decided that it's just not a very good part of town. 
this water hole. Stalking along, searching for cracks in the mud. Oh, speaking of scavengers, hold on. I've spotted another bird. Dominique, now you want to know if there is a big population of animals in Africa. Again, Africa's really, really big. It's bigger than the United States combined with a good few other countries as well. So, Dominique, yes, there's quite a big population of animals, but some numbers are smaller than others. So, for example, with lions, the population is gradually declining. And obviously, the bigger the cities get and the more people there are, the less wild places there are for the animals. So, in Kenya, you sometimes see one and a half million wildebeest moving through from Tanzania to Kenya. Now, Tanzania is a different country. But slowly as time has gone on, those numbers have got smaller and smaller because of fences and because of whatever other, other reasons there are. So although there's lots of animals, wild animals in Africa, their numbers get smaller and smaller because there's just not enough space for all of them to live wild and free like this and um, compete with people as the population grows. And that's why reserves like this place that we're in exist to protect the wild spaces and make sure that the animals don't have to compete with people. Now I'm going to try and show you a bird up ahead. I'm just thinking about the roof. Okay, while I battle to try and show you... There you go. No, there we go. You can't see, can you, Senzo? No. Nope. There's a roof. There's one. I see one there. That one will do. There's actually a, quite a few of them. Lots and lots of vultures. So the vultures are here because the lions were eating food earlier. So they've finished off the scraps. And now they are sitting in the rain because it's just a little bit too cold for them to go out and fly. So a vulture is a very big, very heavy bird. Now we spoke about how the lions find their prey. Vultures do something else entirely. Vultures in this part of the world have exceptionally good eyesight. Really, really good eyesight. Much better than you or I. And what they do is they wait until the day gets nice and warm and they take off and they fly with the air currents and they soar all the way up into the sky, sometimes even recorded as flying as high as a jumbo jet. And they soar around and they use their amazing eyesight to look for animals, dead animals on the ground. And if they can't spot a dead animal, what they'll also look for is other vultures. So once one vulture arrives, you can guarantee that the rest are going to come too. Now out here, unlike in a city, there's no garbage disposal. So a truck doesn't come and remove all of the dead animals if the lions have left scraps behind or something like that. So vultures are actually part of the cleanup committee. And if they didn't exist, then there would be a terrible spread of disease from carcasses that have gone a bit rotten and not very nice anymore. So the vultures actually do an incredibly valuable job when it comes to keeping the savannah clean. So they, every single animal out here plays a very important role in the ecosystem. So this particular vulture is called a white-backed vulture. Now I bet you the white-backed vultures know where the lions are, but if they do know, they're definitely not telling. So I think we're going to have to keep searching to see if we can find them. Okay, so while we go searching, we're going to send you across to Sydney, who's searching for things, but he has to walk. So I have got the type of food a lot of animals are having at the moment. You can see these grasses, but at the moment, most of the grasses are still very dry as well because uh, this is still the dry season, still waiting for more rain to come so that this bush can get excitement and starts to bring back the green leaves. So here at the moment, 
animals that you are seeing, most of them, they are eating these dry grasses. But dry grasses are not bad for them because they have got a lot of water available in the area. After feeding on these gra dry grasses, they must have to go and drink too much water. They... Uh, Sophia, we do have a lot of snakes here and I have seen quite a lot of tracks at the moment. I haven't seen any of the big snakes yet. The tracks showing that snakes are here, there is quite a lot. I saw one snake, sorry, I saw a Mozambican spitting cobra uh, the other day while I was out on a game drive. I saw that one. So this is the best time for the snake, but today the weather is not good. If you look now, the weather is very much dark. It's cold. Snakes don't come out at, at this time. But now let's go to one of my colleagues. Well, here we go. We've got two absolutely gorgeous birds called battaliers. Now they're just hiding from the cool weather they're probably going to roost there but they're a very important bird to know because i'm looking for wild dogs and battaliers will often follow wild dogs because they're such successful hunters we've just come and perched ourselves on top of a big rock where we can see nice and far from to see if we can spot anything from up here now I, it was a difficult question i asked you guys about what was the difference between wild dogs and wolves so wild dogs actually have an extra set of cutting teeth um, they don't chew bones like normal dogs, so their molars are also not as their molars are much sharper. They're not as flat. They're cutting teeth rather than grinding or chewing teeth. So that, and they also don't have a dew claw. So that is the difference between wild dogs and wolves. Sonoma wants to know how do you tell if a bird is pregnant when you see it building a nest. <laughs> I, I, it's very difficult to tell. It's near impossible to tell Sonoma. And we're starting to get a few little spots of rain, but I think it's going to move past us. Now, one of the reasons I'm also sitting up here on top of this rock is I'm listening. Because these wild dogs are looking for girlfriends at the moment. So they make a lot of noise. They run around going, woo, 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 trying to find other wild dogs to be friends with. But they haven't managed to find any over the last few days. So if they are moving, I'm just waiting and listening. And hopefully they make a noise so we can find them. Ava is wondering, what do the birds do if they can't find any food? Unfortunately, Ava, they die. Um, but they are very good at finding food. So those birds eat meat, and they'll pick at leftovers of a carcass that lions might leave behind, or a leopard, or a cheetah, wild dogs. And the wild dogs made a kill very close to where we are now, so I think that's where they were today. Christopher is wondering, are the territories always there? Christopher, I assume you mean like the animal territories? Oh, the tall trees always there. Um, that one will eventually fall down because that's a dead tree. But yes, there, there are lots of, lots, lots of trees around. Sorry about that, Christopher. I, I didn't hear your question properly. And you can see lots of big trees around. But unfortunately for us, no wild dogs calling just yet. Now, Carter is wondering how many animals can fly. Well, of course, birds can fly and bats, butterflies. So insects can fly, butterflies, bugs, beetles. Not all of them, but quite a lot of them can fly. What else can fly? That's about it. Insects, birds, and bats. So a lot of animals that are called flying animals, like flying fish and flying squirrels, they don't actually fly, they glide. It's very, very peaceful up on the big rock here. 
I think I'm going to move on shortly to go see if maybe the wild dogs didn't head towards the east a bit. But it seems like this cold weather is making all the dogs and cats hide. So let's go see how Jamie's search for lions is going. I agree with Brent. It looks as though this weather has sent all of the animals into hiding. So they were all around and about this morning. But now it's cold, it's windy, and they're probably curled up somewhere tucked away underneath the trees. Now, I apologize. Every now and again, you'll hear this radio start to make a bit of noise. It's just so I can talk to the other guides. Now, Elijah, you want to know how fast you can drive on a safari. Well, Elijah, it's not good to drive too fast in safari unless you really have to because otherwise you don't see the animals. So some animals like a leopard are really, really well camouflaged. So they're hidden in the grass or the bushes. And if you're driving too fast, you're not gonna see them. Also, especially in weather like this, things like tortoises come out onto the road or even just, even just insects or, or anything like that. And you could actually squash them. And that would be very sad. So we don't drive very fast at all. We actually drive really, really slowly. And you'll notice that I'm driving over lots of bumps in the road. Now that's not to keep people from driving too fast, but it certainly helps. And Jonathan, while we search for our lions, you want to know what the smartest animal is out here. There's a couple of very, very intelligent animals, but of course it's difficult to test an animal's intelligence. You know, um, some people are better at doing one thing and some people are better at doing mathematics and some people are better at English or you know, whatever it happens to be. Everybody has their talent. And with animals, it's really difficult to decide which one's smarter and which one's not. But there are certain animals that stand out to us as humans as being quite smart. One is an elephant. Elephants are quite intelligent. They have a brain that is three times the size of a human being's. So that means that they're doing a lot of thinking. And another animal, believe it or not, is a hyena, which is thought to be in some aspects even smarter than a chimpanzee. Now, I love impala. Okay, there's another female lionesses. Okay. There we go, we've got some impala now. Unfortunately, as beautiful as these antelope are, they are probably not right up there on the list of the smartest antelope. Cadence would like to know, while we watch the antelope, what type of water we have up here. Cadence, it's, it's largely the regular kind of water. It's still all, the old H2O. Um, what you find with the water here is that it comes from boreholes. Now, what that means is that each place has a deep, deep hole, almost like a well, and then a piece of machinery that pumps water from below the surface of the soil and into our taps. So we're very lucky we have running water here. Not everyone in South Africa is fortunate enough to have water that comes out of the tap, but we're lucky enough to do so. And it is safe to drink, but it tastes a little bit funny because it comes from the ground. And in this area, there's quite a high level of calcium. So it's what we call hard water. But it, so it tastes a bit funny, but it doesn't hurt you in any way. Now, Giovanni would like to know what kind of animals the impala eat. Giovanni, fortunately for us, the impala are vegetarians. In other words, they are herbivores and they don't eat any animals out here. Why do I say that's fortunate? Because there are so many impala that if they did eat meat, we would be in big trouble because they would not be able to feed all of those impala. So there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of impala, probably around about 100,000 or 200,000 in the greater Kruger. 
Actually, I just made that number up. I'm not sure how many Impala there are. Quite a lot. Fortunately, though, none of those couple of hundred thousand eat meat. So they eat plants. Right, on that note, it is time for us to say farewell to the kids that are joining us today. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed your safari and perhaps learnt a little bit about this amazing place that we call home. I hope we see you again soon. For the rest of you, off your papa back on foot with Sydney while I listen to the ominous rumblings of thunder. I am right here on top of the termite mound, but it's difficult to see that this is a termite mound. You can see the, the termite mound begins there, but this whole tree is now having the termite mound in the middle, all the way to the end. So this termite mound are eating this whole tree from the inside. And with me here is the elephant dung. So the elephants, I know the droppings of the elephants are used for various purposes and one of the purposes I have used is that when you've got problems here inside the nose if you've got some of the problems inside the nose and not just the nose bleeding also if you've got some wounds inside you can burn it and sniff that in order to kill that it works very well in Chivenda we call it Ngongo this is a disease which affects the nose and we only know of one medicine one traditional medicine specifically for that is the elephant dung nothing else can cure that apart from this and it works very nicely doesn't even have the side effect you don't have to uh, you don't have to inhale the whole elephant dung you can just inhale a little bit a little bit and that is going to help you in order to fight those kind of a problem so you can see that the elephant droppings is like the mother of all medicines because it works for various purposes So I was just listening now, the weather is changing, the rain is drumming, and the clouds, you can see they're building there. The chances of us turning back, they are very high at the moment. Uh, we're just waiting and to move forward and see if the rain comes, unfortunately, we will have to take to go back. So I'm seeing uh, one of the plants here. It's ve the Nico Nico, the elephant dung, it smells very nicely. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm used to it. When it's dry, <laughs> when it's dry, it doesn't smell like anything. When it's wet, it smells like the khaki boss. If you take the khaki boss, khaki boss is one of the plants which is occurring in Australia and it was brought in South Africa by the other people long time ago. If you take it and rub against the khaki boss and smell it, it smells exactly the same like the elephant dung, which is also related to the normal body smell of the elephant. This one, when it's dry, you can use it to chase mosquitoes. When you burn it, it starts to generate a distinctive smell, which is the one that can chase the mosquitoes. So the smell when it's green and the smell when it's dry is different from when it's burning. So it means it's about three different smells. So now, while I'm still looking for any other interesting things, let's go to Brent, who is now driving along. I'll be using the elephant dung as my mic this afternoon. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. Uh, elephant dung has got lots of uses. When it's one of the oh hello uh, most effective tetsy fly repellents I've ever ever had the pleasure of using. And you put it in a steel pot and you burn it at your feet to stop the tetsy flies biting you. We used to do that in Zambia and in Tanzania. But I'm still looking for the wild dogs. Unfortunately, the tracking is a bit difficult at the moment. I'm just going very slowly along here. We left them this morning down in the low area here.
Hello to Take Care. Take Care would like to know, do territorial animals hide in the same place during bad weather? No, not necessarily. I mean, they'll have a few favorite spots, but very seldom will they take refuge in the exact same spot. However, when it comes to giving birth, territorial animals, particularly the, the cats and uh, hyenas and uh, wild dogs or predators in general, uh, jackals as well, will uh, give birth in the same spot. Here's a little steer and borky. That is a, a bite-sized snack for the African wild dog. But that steer and borky is looking very relaxed. So have all the impala we've been seeing. So they must have moved. It's been cool all day, so they could have moved at any time. Oh. Some very upset guinea fowl, Craig. Let's go have a look there. Now, also, while in this area, I'm always hoping to bump into one of my favorite leopards who I haven't seen in an age. This is quarantine country around here. He's been hanging out just over this ridge where we don't have signal. I can hear a lot of guinea fowls alarming up towards this area. So, who knows? Maybe quarantine's about. Or Tandy. Or Tlalamba. So, I have a quick look at those guinea fowl alarming. Now, of course, it could be as simple as that they're alarming at uh, a bird of prey or, or a slender mongoose or a snake. Has anyone been down this road today? Except for me this morning. Doesn't look like it. Now, the general direction of those dogs was east, but we've seen them change direction so many times over the last two days that they literally could turn up at Juma. Yeah, there's guinea fowl alarming somewhere over here. H. Macy is wondering, is tracking harder in high winds or rain? Both. So the high winds do brush over the tracks. There's also been a herd of buffalo here since I was here this morning, interestingly enough. Uh, so there could be lions around if there's buffalo. This is also Torchwood Pride country. I'm just going to switch off and have a little listen again. See if those guinea fowls still sound angry. Of course, Franklins, keep quiet. They're still up ahead here somewhere. I think they're on Wild Dog Road. Wouldn't it be apt to find wild dogs on Wild Dog Road? Which way were these buffalo heading? Dag nabbit. Buffalo heading this way. I just want to have a quick look over. We can, can't go much further than this um, before we lose signal over this ridge. But I just want to stop on the high ground here, have a look towards the Kruger boundary, see if we can get a long distance visual of those buffalo. Now I concentrate on seeing what's about here. Let's go to Jamie, who's going to reveal the answer to Tracking Tuesday. Dun dun dun! The time in the week that everybody looks forward to with eager anticipation. Senzo is giving us a drum roll. Well done to Debbie and Anne who who got it who got it correct this week. What did you want me to sing? Tracking Tuesday. What did you like? Kirst has asked me to sing something. Sing a song. Um. Oh gosh! I wish you'd give me. I do, I do wish that that Kirst would give me more warning when she wishes for me to write little little musical ditties because you know, I, I'm panicking, I'm flustered, I'm flustered, and now I want to draw in the sand and I can't because it's all rock and it's all a disaster. And Debbie and Anne know what the answers are because they got it right, but none of the rest of you do because I haven't showed you the picture yet. 
Uh, okay, so Tracking Tuesday does need a little song. I'll have to think of one. Hold off, all right? I'll, let me tell you what the track was and we'll all have a nice chuckle about that and then, and then we can do it. Now, unfortunately, the light is terrible today. So I'm just looking for a nice sandy piece of ground where I can fully develop the concept of a Tracking Tuesday and why the track is what the track is and why it is not what the track isn't which in this case apparently a lot of the incorrect answers suggested it might be a wild dog all right for want of a better place to be we are going to try here and let me see where the position of the pole is there okay i'm going to get out and draw here sense but first let's show those of you who come on rotate no don't go silent you're already on silent just rotate Ah, here we go. Tracking Tuesday. So for those of you that missed the social media post, this was the curious track that was put up. Apparently a lot of people said wild dog. Now if you can't see which what the track is there, one, two, three, four toes, and the back pad over there. So that is the track, and well done to Debbie and Anne who got it correct. It was in fact a genet no idea which species of genet because it is impossible to tell from their footprint now wild dog would be okay let me jump out sense can you just zoom in let me see which is the best part of the soil to draw on because that pole is very much in my way okay next to that rock and those sticks perfect okay i'll jump out if curse needs to tell me anything she can relay it through senzo so now actually might any lines Probably should have checked first. Oh well, we'll find out. So, a Janet's track is roughly the size of just larger than my fingernail. So around about, you'll see on that on that picture about an inch. That was a very very big Janet track, but it is a perfect perfect little track. It's got these tiny tiny toes, four toes, and a back pad. It looks like okay. This is about the size of a civet track. It looks like a civet track made smaller so i i look at it and i usually see it around about my thumbnail size in deep sand like that you might see the claws coming through just a little bit but most of the time it's just this perfect little paw print now the only thing really that has a track the same size as a genet is a is a mongoose now mongoose if i make it bigger mongoose have an asymmetrical back pad so most things like a civet or a genet have a sort of a perfect circle to their back pad and their toes. So they, if, I'm, if I sort of zoom in, there's a rock in my way. Oh dear, and I left the radio on. Okay, so they've got a sort of a perfectly circular track if you look at the outline. Now in mongoose, which is the only thing that has a very similar size track, a mongoose has an asymmetrical back pad so the back part of the foot extends down one side um, sort of like this so the one side of the, the the back of the foot is longer than the other does that make sense and then the toes are here I don't know how well you can really see but it's terrible soil for drawing I didn't have a choice though so the only thing that you could really confuse a genet track with was a mongoose, but one side of a mongoose's back pad is longer than the other, asymmetrical. A wild dog would be roughly four to five times the size of a genet track. I mean, a wild dog track's about this big, quite a lot bigger. So if you were looking next to that ruler, it would be probably close on two and a half inches or so. Does that look like about two and a half inches? Yeah. Give or take. So a, a wild dog track looks very, very similar to a domestic dog track. There we go. I'm all plugged in again. Let's go find these lions. So bravo. Ah, Christina. The Sorry, I was just checking to see if they hadn't found the lions. 
You want to know if the genet is in the cat family? It is not in the cat family, nor is it in the dog family. Although I always think when I describe a genet to someone who's never seen a genet before, I describe it as a a mixture. If somebody crossed a cat and a mongoose, you'd get a genet. But it's not related to cats. It is more closely related to mongoose. And if I remember correctly, at one point was lumped together in with the mongoose family. So it was put in the mongoose family. It has since been decided that it is not part of the mongoose family. It is known as a viverid. So it belongs to the viveridae family. And mongooses were given their own family, which is the herpestid family or herpestidae family. And then a little closely connected branch to that is the mustelid family, honey badgers, mustelidae. And then not so far away, no, actually pretty far away, is the next closely related family, which is hyenidae or hyenas. So, genets belong to the viverid family. Now, a viverid is basically a mixture between a cat and a mongoose. Don't know how else to put it. They are defined by the shape and structure of their anal glands, to go into the specifics. So, the viverids, the mustelids, and the herpestidae family, they all have anal glands that they use to produce a paste, which they then mark their territory and communicate through pheromones. Now, that anal paste is different in, different in consistency, but more importantly, the gland that produces it underneath their tail is uh, structured differently in each family. So, genets are part of the viverids. Complicated little track, tiny little track. And unfortunately, today is not the day for tracking. When it comes to little things like that, you're not gonna see them. I can't even see a lion track. So, you know. Ah, the good news. That's a place to start. The good news says that they, for I know not if it is he or she, that they are no good at tracks except for snake tracks. Okay, snake tracks pretty easy. It's sort of the glide through the sand, unless of course it's a puff at it, in which case it goes in a straight line. Bit confusing. But by and large, snake tracks, not a bad start. Can you, go, can you tell us which direction a snake is going in? Because that's the next step with tracking. So there's no need to fret. Tracking is just a way of reading. It is a way of reading a new, the bush newspaper. So you wake up every morning and you look at the ground and the ground, if you are able to understand it, will tell you what has transpired over the course of the night or the afternoon or whatever it happens to be. And that's why we enjoy tracking so much. That and of course it helps us find the animals, but not always. You have to find their footprints first. I also find that watching the animals helps. The good news says no, that they cannot tell which way they're going. Well, the good news, the good news is, is that I'm going to show you how to tell which way a snake track is going because at this point I cannot show you anything else. So hold on, we'll go, let me just check that there aren't lions here and then I'll show you which way a snake track is going. It's very easy. Yes, they do go forward. Okay, fair. Kirsty has raised a point. Their snakes do go forward. I meant when you're not looking at the... Oh, never mind. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. I meant which direction the snake went in while it was going forwards because snakes do not go backwards. There we go. <laughs> oh, difficult, difficult. Hm. This, this is bones everywhere, buffalo bones, from a time when the Inkahumas just waited at this waterhole and grabbed buffalo as they came for a drink. I thought these lions would be in here somewhere, but they obviously decided to wander off in this cold weather. Uh-oh. Better not take off my, my cameraman, he won't appreciate that. Okay, well, I continue to thoroughly unsuccessfully track these lions. I might have to hang up my tracking cap. Let's go across to Sydney, who has managed to track down a puddle.
So after a very long trekking, we managed to get hold of the uh, pothole now. And this pothole is very stationary. You can see there's quite a lot of water droplets showing that the weather condition is changing. It is raining, as I indicated earlier, the possibilities. So these kind of water holes can be very much dangerous because animals, wild animals, they don't mind drinking here. And some of them, they do transmit quite a lot of uh, dangerous and detrimental diseases. Some of the animals suffering from rabies, they will come here and drink and leave the rabies contaminating these water holes. And if you come and drink this water or treat this water with cut on your skin, your skin is going to absorb the problem. So we've got to respect the water holes all the time. Don't consider a water hole a safe place. It is contaminated with quite a lot of dangerous diseases. So some of the animals, like the warthogs, they come to this area in order to roll so that they can get the mud and and, and get rid of the parasite when they are doing the, uh, the, the uh, scratching against the trees. They do this by their post where they find the trees or the tree stem and scratch against them to get rid of the parasite. Those are the rubbing post areas for these kind of animals. So the buffaloes has been here. I can see quite a lot of tracks showing that this morning they were just everywhere. So they went towards the direction where we are going. Chances of seeing them, they are very much high. Maybe they are heading much more towards the uh, Vuyatelapen area. So here are the tracks for the buffaloes, nice and clear. So it's very difficult to tell if it's a buffalo like this. And what causes this is that when they are walking, when the ground is too fresh uh, after the rains, this is what happens. But if it's nice and clear, you can be able to see the track. But now it's like a round shape without the two division of the, the hoofs. So we don't treat the diseases in these animals. We are managing a natural system. So when the animals got problems, it's like nature is taking its course. Here are some of the diseases they do attend, they do get attended to, but mostly some of the natural areas here in South Africa, they believe on nature taking its course. Nico Nico, here in Southern Africa, we do get uh, quite a lot of rabies affecting quite a lot of wild animals. You will see the symptoms such as the salivas coming out everywhere. That is a very good sign of the rabies. And rabies is one of the dangerous diseases, as I indicated earlier on. So I'm trying to check here to see if we can find any other interesting small insects here. But insects are hiding now when the rain is drizzling. Since I've started, I haven't picked up any of the insects today. And I was hoping to see a lot because it rained a lot last night. And so now uh, let's go to Brent who is still looking for the carnivores. Indeed I am. Uh, unfortunately, those guinea fowl I think were alarming at a carnivore, but a little one, a slender mongoose. They were all sitting in low trees. So unfortunately we didn't see the slender mongoose either, but that's what I would guess. So I'm going to do one last gamble here towards the north for the dogs. And uh, then I think I might head back towards Juma. See if we can have any luck with either Tengana or Hosanna. Painted Wolf is asking what is the most endangered carnivore in South Africa? The African wild dog. Um, yeah, 
pretty much African wild dog, the most endangered, second most endangered canid in Africa. Who can tell me what is the most endangered canid or dog in Africa? Hashtag Safari Live, if you know the answer. Is that an Ellie or is that just grey playing tricks on my eyes? There have been those wonderful, there's been some really wonderful massive Ellie bulls around at the moment. And I'm hoping that that large dark mass in the distance is one of them. Oh no, I thought I saw meat in a tree, but it's not. It's just a funny branch hanging down. Now the problem is now with this little bit of rain, there's such lots of little puddles around. So they are not, the, the, the carnivals are not forced to go to their normal drinking spots. Crazy egg, you are spot on. It is indeed the Ethiopian wolf, or the simian fox is another name for it. And they live in the very high altitude mountains of Ethiopia. And uh, 95 or 96% of their diet is rodents. And one of the more interesting things, now where was this big grey beastie? I think, I'm not sure if it was an elephant, I couldn't really see through the trees. Uh, 90, and, and the most amazing thing about that is that, that they eat all those rodents. And the biomass, in terms of the actual meat mass in the Ethiopian highlands, and it's made up almost exclusively of rodents, is more than the Mara Serengeti system. There's more meat in rats in the Ethiopian highlands than there are in wildebeest and zebra in the migration. Isn't that amazing? You get some really big rats there as well. Oh no. I can't see anything here. I was really hoping there was that big eddy ball, but... Firebird is wondering what is the most endangered herbivore in South Africa? It is almost certainly, without a doubt, the river rhine rabbit. Endemic to the dry river systems of the Karoo. And that is definitely the most endangered herb of all in South Africa. In Africa? Hmm. It might even be the river rhine rabbit. I was trying to think, a carpe is probably up there. Again, with an animal like a copy, it's difficult to know. But I think I'll, I'll have to double check that for you guys, but I th I'm pretty sure, I think the Riverine Rabbit, if not the most endangered, is definitely top five in terms of endangered herbivores. Where was that thing now? It was here somewhere. I mean, just looked, it's, it's quite dreary and grey today. That's why I'm wearing bright colours to colour it out, okay, to, to add some light and light to this afternoon safari. And Kirsten says, I look fabulous. Well, thank you, doll. It's almost the same color as your hair, Kirsten. Actually, your, your hair is more this color, Kirsten. Orange. Yes, Kirsten's hair color is knickknacks. I think that's an excellent description. Well done, Kirsten. <laughs> She's getting quite upset to the radio. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, Craig. I think from now on, we, I think we should start calling Kirsty Knickknack because her hair is the colour of knickknacks. Now, for those of you who don't know what knickknacks are, they are a very delicious, very bad for you, MSG filled, um, like crisp or potato, or not even a potato chip, a maize chip. Uh, I reckon there's almost zero good things in a knickknack, but they do taste very well. Oh dear. Okay, we need to start moving. There's some big rain coming from the south. Actually, I'm gonna go that way. It's gonna be quicker. Um, and we took a bit of a chance by not putting our roof on to come for the dogs. That's why Jamie's got her roof on. But I think we're gonna try head back to around Juma so we can pop our roof on quickly. Um, I'm gonna have to go through a bit of a dip here, so we might be losing us in a second knickknack. Okay, uh, Jamie's got, got 
on to put her covers on. I'm going to start doing some low flying. Let's go hack at how Jamie puts rain covers on. What? Brenty? No, let me tell you how this conversation went with, uh, with Brent this afternoon. It went, I don't want to take a roof to chase wild dogs. I'm sure it's not going to rain, says Brent. Where's the back of this now? It's upside down, but it doesn't really matter. Now this is a beautifully designed rain cover. Rain cover. What it does is it redirects every every particle of you know the the old H two O, the water that we get here. Um, it redirects every every drop of it down the presenter's back. I love it. It's my favourite. Now we're just going to give Sens his skirt. This is his his skirt cover that goes around Sens's waist and around the camera pedestal. There you go in a way similar to a hula skirt and we're all prepped and ready because we kept our roof on okay well this is fun I really want to be driving north away from the rain but unfortunately I happen to be on the northern boundary when this hit so I have no choice but to drive south especially if I want to go towards the hyena den which I kind of do might take me a while to get there if my game drive radio handheld starts to talk to me you're going to have to just bear with it because I don't even know where it is under all of this. Onwards! Come rain or shine! Hink! I'm desperately thinking. Hink would like to know what is the purpose of mice in nature. Seed dispersal? Food for food for other predators? Like um, they're part of the food chain for, for owls and snakes and birds of prey and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, they I can't think of anything else. They feed things. They might disperse grass seeds, help to b control the balance in, in terms of grass and wooded material, with, depending on what they eat, if they eat grass seeds or perhaps eat the seeds of trees. What other purposes do mice serve? It's actually a really good question. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Let's think of some purposes for mice. There's one that lives in my bedroom. And every evening when Brent and I go to bed, it goes running under the bed and that is where it spends its night. And then when we get up in the morning, it goes ka ha, ha, ha. Mr. Public, touche. To operate our computers, yes indeed. That is the purpose of a mouse. You, you move the cursor around and you click on things. And right click and left click and all sorts of clicking. Okay, fair. Fair enough. Well done, bravo. Stephen's gone down the comic route as well and he says to scare elephants. We actually had a discussion about this not so long ago and they do in fact scare elephants ever so slightly. Not specifically mice but something small rustling around at their feet and moving at high speed does create a general feeling of unsettledness within an elephant herd so they can get, get a fright from a mouse at their feet bizarrely. Remember they've also got a blind spot below their heads so they they can't actually they can hear it and they can you know, they can't really see what it is and it, it frightens them because elephants are actually surprisingly jumpy for being the biggest animal out here. So yes to scare elephants that's another purpose. I'd... Wow! This afternoon has, been, has, has given us some interesting ones. Take Care would like to know if mice snore. I... Yes. Yes. Especially once they reach their sort of middle age period and particularly if they've led a somewhat indulgent lifestyle and are slightly, slightly ruddy around the cheeks and the neck and um, or perhaps if they sleep on their backs, they definitely snore. And if they have a, a sinus infection, then they snore. 
and usually what happens is that in, in little mice couples one will say you snore dear and the other one will say no I don't and that will go on until the day they die um, each insisting that the other snores and that they do not and by the end of it one of them attempts to smother the other in their sleep because they realize they simply cannot live with it at three o'clock in the morning it went down a dark route mouse owners mice owners any of you out there who can attest to whether or not mice snore do any of you own mice can you tell us hashtag safari live on twitter please i'm all ears and nose I, of course, do not snore. <laughs> Mr. Public says if a mouse snores and he's not married, does he make a sound? No. These are the deep philosophical questions that we need to be asking ourselves on an afternoon like this afternoon, as this deep gray bank of clouds rolls in towards us this is a very good point i don't think he makes a sound but it is a very deep philosophical question and um is he not married because he snores or or is it or was he married perhaps she left him because of it in which case he really i mean he really should have just bought her a nice set of earplugs for christmas or whatever holidays mice celebrate birthdays or harvest days or uh, not being eaten by a bird of prey day <laughs> it's very very strange very strange tangent we've gone down here i'm trying to get to the hyena den but i know that they're not going to be home hit me with it cursed come on it cannot get any weirder do it Marcelo, do rabbits wear hats? First of all, I would like to put my hand up and say I was mistaken. It could get weirder. Do rabbits wear hats? Yes. They really like top hats because they can tuck their ears in. So it helps to keep them upright and sort of, you know, it just, it, it really, it really keeps their ears warm. Now, when it's cold out, a rabbit or wearing a beanie, is actually adorable they've got little pom-poms on the top and then every time they twitch their ears the pom-pom vibrates the really cool ones uh, will wear a tiny tiny baseball cap that fits between the ears and helps to keep their eyes shaded during the day and scrub hairs now now scrub hairs wear feathers scrub hairs wear feathers they are actually the fashion icons of the bush, where hats are concerned. No, rabbits do not wear hats, except in Alice in Wonderland, which was a book that terrified me as a child. Absolutely terrified me. The thought of leaving reality into this crazy world, which I think is deeply revealing about my personality type. Okay, I found you an Impala. Impalas wear scarves, I don't know. Imagine an Impala in a scarf. It would look quite dashing and shame. I actually wish I could have given one to that female we saw earlier. Right, let's see if there's any babies. Brent's day has passed. He was mistaken. There were no baby Impala seen live uh, yesterday. Trishala's day is next. She thinks tomorrow. It coincides with Diwali. So Trishala's next on the list. I can't remember what date I said. I'm not sure. Soon, very, very soon, we will be seeing little baby impalas. And if the weather stays like this, we're going to have to get them little mittens and scarves and hats. For it is very chilly. Do rabbits wear hats? Good grief. <laughs> so we've had, do we have cities here in Africa? What kind of water do we have? 
if a, mouse, if a mouse snores and it isn't married, it doesn't make a sound, and we've had do rabbits wear hats. I really don't know where to take the conversation from here. I fear you have derailed me completely. Bri no, you know what? I do not believe that impala have existential crises. There are certain animals that I believe perhaps might. Um, I think that that wildebeest often have an existential crisis, uh, and when they when they're standing, they're going, woof, woof, oh, ma, 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 ma. In the Mara, they're actually debating their their entire existence and what their purpose is. But I I feel as though impala are sort of hippie esque in their approach to life. I feel as though they are all about peace, love, and and really just enjoying themselves. Unfortunately, they've fallen on hard times, but they're taking it in their stride, so to speak. The years will pass, and on they will go. And to be quite honest, it does not do to have an existential crisis if you're an impala, because they would be in a permanent state of panic. Imagine. Um, especially for for the female impala, who probably have to be quite pragmatic about the fact that in the course of their lifetime they might lose several lambs to various predators. I don't think it does... I don't, I don't think it would do the animal any good to have an existential crisis as an impala. I think they have to be very pragmatic. Oh, there goes Bill. Sorry, Bill. Yep, he's gone. Oh, there goes Fred. He's, Fred's been taken by... I'm really sorry if any of you are named Bill or Fred. Been taken by the wild dogs. Oh, no, Nigel's gone. Oh goodness, a question! I was so prepared for, for another bizarre piece of nonsense and I am the worst person at this sort of thinking, I really am. Silver Wolf, what is the purpose of the back stripe on the bottom of the Impala? Now of course every single Impala has, has vanished off. Ah, oh, there we go, there's some more Impala. Uh, let us talk about the black stripe on the bottom. Funnily enough, I'm sitting with Lauren in the back and we were just talking about how she is not allowed to ever, ever call the Impala the McDonald's of the bush, even if the black stripes on the bottom resemble an M and they are eaten by everything else. We are not allowed to use that cliché. Okie dokie, let's talk about the black stripe on the bottom. So one of the theories behind it, which I question immensely, now don't all run away, you horrible little beasties. How's that sense? You got her there. Cool. I have a plastic bag covering my monitor so I can't see. So, one of the theories is that the black fur around the bottom heats up more than the fur around it and due to the fact that ticks are attracted both to warmth and to the more sensitive areas of skin, the idea is, or the theory states, that they will then congregate around the black patch on the bottom and that draws it away from the uh, more sensitive areas and allows the impala to reach back and groom them away using the loose teeth in the bottom of its jaw which form a comb-like structure and the reason why impala always look so well put together. You know what, I changed my mind about that existential crisis. I forgot how often impala groom themselves as if they need to get dressed up to go out. So that is what, in theory, one of the or one of the explanations behind the markings of the impala. The truth is, I think we come up with a lot of different explanations behind animal markings, and I'm not a hundred percent convinced about all of them. Uh, one thing we do know about the color black. No, we can't see them anymore. One thing that we do know about the color black is that it is a, a color that shows up. Now that sounds very silly when I say it that way. Um, but it is a, a color that emphasizes in the bush, it stands out. So the black on the backs of lions' ears, for example, they've now decided or, or done research and discovered that the, the lions will communicate using subtle twitches of their ears while they're hunting and the black helps to highlight that. 
Now, I don't know if perhaps the black markings or uh, they, they highlight, along with the white under the tail, they highlight the areas of the impala that are important in its social communication. <laughs> Just give me one moment. I can't find that radio. It's gone. It's gone under the cover somewhere. Oh, there it is. Found it. And turn all right on. Oh, sorry. I've been on a handheld. I uh, just was wondering what the lock of that was. Okay. I'm just going to have a quick chat on the radio. Let's go back across to... Back across to Sydney to see what he's up to. So I've got a, a rock of a, a different type here. So this is uh, called a quad side. So if you can check, this rock is much lighter. And we use this kind of rocks in order to uh, heal some of the problems. So I'm going to explain to you nicely so that uh, you can understand how we treat the problems, make use of the rocks. If you've got a problem with the legs if you, you you've got a problem your legs is sore or is the bones are painful you're walking like this this is what we do when you're walking like this and the bones are painful we take this kind of rocks maybe four of them we burn them with coals and we boil water and when boiling that water uh, we are going to put some of the ingredients from some of these trees and this is what we do when these rocks are burning when they change color, when they are very red, in the middle of a band, we take each of them and put them in a steel basket. And that steel basket is going to have those leaves there with the hot water. And we steam you. And after steaming you is when this is going to be resolved. And apart from that, we use the very same rocks in order to diagnose the symptoms of some of the diseases affecting you. We were using it too much in order to diagnose diseases such as the smallpox. In order to, uh, to diagnose that, we steam you, we wrap you with a blanket to make sure that no air is entering there. And after that, you are going to sweat, and that is how we are going to diagnose if you have got uh, smallpox or not. So there's uh, some buffalo weavers now just about to get back to the nest. You can see right there. I can see one of them is out there. So this kind of birds can be able to use also the false walls to go in there. They create very big nests. Look at that. You can see that that kind of a nest is unbelievable. You cannot believe it was built by such a very a small bird. It looks like it's one of the big eagles. If you look at the vultures, their nests are not even uh, as big as the buffalo weaver's nest. Sami, I have seen the ground hornbills before, and let me tell you a story. I have witnessed this. I saw a ground hornbill one day busy knocking a, a, a leopard turtle. So a leopard turtle was walking, and the ground hornbill was knocking the leopard turtle, and those ground hornbills managed to open the back of the leopard turtle and eat the leopard turtle alive. So ground hornbill, their beaks are very much strong. So you will hear them making noises, very scary noises like mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. So that is how they call. And if it's two of them, it's unbelievable. You will think maybe there's people talking in there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Seb. <laughs> so I sounded like the ground hornbills. <laughs> so, but they like to eat too much frogs. So now let's go to Brent, who is just driving at the moment. Yeah, as we run, Torchwood's definitely getting a lot more rain than on Juma. We're back on Juma now, and there's a few spits around, but nothing too bad. So. I don't know if anyone told you that Tingana tried to scare Nick Knacks Kirsten today. He seems to either found a dead in Yala close to Kirsten's room or caught one. So he actually, Rex and had to actually move it. It was too close to where people were. 
So we're gonna go have a look around Galago Pan, see if he's maybe popped out of that thick river system that he likes to hang about in. And who knows, maybe Hassan is gonna steal from his dad today. <laughs> Sammy Jane would like to know, what is the scariest thing found dead or alive in FC except for Kirsten? Remember, Kirsten is now called Knickknacks. It's no longer Kirsten. We're only referring to her as Knickknacks now. Um, hmm. I would say there's been quite a few scary things to happen in FC and rap parties when Final Control becomes a disco tech. Uh, I think that's probably the scariest thing. Kirsten says she found a dead slug once. Um, and a, scorp a few scorpions. Have we ever found a snake in the FC? Old FC, yes. We found a few snakes in old FC. Um, but I don't think we found a snake in new FC. Not that I know of. There was a squirrel, apparently, that Geraldine Kent chased out of FC. And speaking of squirrels, I mean, it gets... Uh, they're lizards and geckos. Um, speaking of squirrels though, when it gets really hot, which it does here, yeah, one day I walked into our bedroom and the fan was going and there was this squirrel spread out on the bed lying right in front of the fan to try to cool down. Irritating squirrel. Stole my orange as well. I've been saving this orange for a day or two. It was earlier this week. I was like, oof, it's going to be so perfectly ripe in a day or two. And I got there and the squirrel had demolished it. Evil squirrel eating my oranges. But no, um, what is the scariest thing we've had in camp in total? I mean, we have hyenas in camp quite regularly. We've had elephants in camp regularly. It's been a while since we had lions properly in camp, but they have been in camp before. Kirsten says they had me in camp. Yes, knickknacks. You're just trying to get me back because we're calling you knickknacks from now on. I'm, I'm going to start a thing. Hopefully it takes off. And Kirsten, you must be... She's going to call me Paddywhack, which means absolutely nothing to me, so go for it. But you know what? If we're warring with Kirsten, we might as well war properly. Kirsten, do you know what's coming? Kirsten, sometimes makes funny faces when you put a camera near her. So if Kirsten wants to, I've been threatening to, to actually uh, post this um, on, so, on, on social media. I haven't got around to it yet, but I suppose this is just as good, isn't it? Now, where is that picture of Kirsten making funny faces? Is it on here? <gasps> I can't even remember what she was scowling at. How did Brent ever think that he was going to get away with that when Kirsty is directing and in control of his feed? How did he ever think that that was actually going to happen? Well done, Kirsten. I don't know how he thought he was going to get away with that. Bye, guys. Thank you. That's the bushwalk team. Chattering away behind us while Kirsten's going, Jamie, I'm coming to crash. I'm going to crash cut you as soon as Brent shows you this picture. Crash cut, live, live. How did you think he was going to manage that, idiot? <laughs> uh, and, and the thing is, is that Kirsty is, is the head of the department. So no matter which director he tries that with, it will never work because every single one will crash cut away from him any time he tries. Oh, Brenty. Good try, good try. Totally misguided. It's not a terrible picture. I mean, it, it, there are worse pictures out there. I'm pretty sure there's worse pictures of me. Are you happy now, Kirst? You feel a little bit better. You are brilliant, Kirst. You are brilliant. Don't let that go to your head, though. <laughs> Too late. Too late. 
Her head has swelled like a balloon. She'll have to get one of those hats that rabbits wear. I don't know what I'm talking about. The bushwalk team is racing back to the ward's camp, I think. Uh, Rex, shame. Poor Rex was trying to have a chat to me, and I was just waiting for the crash cut, and I couldn't split my attention enough. Alrighty, so I, can, I saw where Brent is. He's come back to Juma. We're going to go to the hyena den and just take a chance, because it's one of those afternoons that is just, unless you've got a nice static sighting, like Hosanna on a kill or the lions or whatever it happens to be, it's just really, really difficult because the sand is not great for tracks. The animals are hiding. I mean, the, you know, we can talk about monkey orange or something if we really want to, but we do have the bushwalk team out. So we're going to go to the hyena den. Not that I need an excuse. I just don't think it's going to be active yet. Let's see. Maybe this horrible weather will have prompted them to move earlier. It was predicted that it was going to rain 20 mils yesterday and it didn't uh, if it rained 10 it would have been a lot it rained enough for there to be a puddle in the road i think it rained about 10 so we do another 10. kiwi mm, kiwi would like to know is there's an animal that stinks more than a hyena it really depends on the day and what the animal's eaten because sometimes wild dogs roll in lion scat. So, you know, that's pretty smelly. And lions can be really, really stinky when they want to be. Although, to be honest, not as stinky as a hyena because lions tend not... Oh, they do roll in smelly things. But most of the time, lions don't really smell themselves. What they're eating smells, their breath smells. And when you get close to their claws, the, their claws stink of rancid meat. But, no, I'm not sure that there's many things that smell worse than a hyena, to be quite frank. I love them, but they are not pretty smelling animals. They, you, you wouldn't make a, a candle that was sort of said spotted hyena on it, that when you burnt it, wafted gentle aroma of a spotted hyena across your house. You'd never have any visitors ever again. Actually, it might just work. There might be a market for that, for the antisocial. I can't think of anything that smells quite as bad as a hyena on a regular basis. Dog smell, but it's not a bad smell. It's a sort of a, a wet, slightly stinkier than a wet dog. Waterbuck smell, but again, leathery, not a musky. Okay, as the great bank of clouds gets ever closer, let's go across to Sydney, who is making his way rapidly to shelter. So I am now with the leadwood tree. The leadwood tree is one of those hardwood trees. And this tree is also medicinally used. And one of the medicine this tree is, is, uh, is used for, which is very important, is to support fertility. If you go and take the root of the amarula tree and mix it together with the root of this uh, leadwood tree, it is going to solve that problem. But this is how it's done. You don't just take any root here. If you look, we have got the roots. Now it's just that the root, these roots are now uh, starting to uh, get the rough scales because they're exposed to the sun. Now it's trying to cover itself. But if you can check, this root is by the western side. And we have got this one here. This one is by the eastern side. When this tree is standing, some of the roots are facing west, some are facing east. This is the root we must cut. We come and cut this root here, a small piece, and we mix it with the root of the marula tree. And then we boil it and give it to someone else in order to support fertility. But this, it works to both men and women. Uh, next time I will show you another plant that we are using in order to save as a contraception. So that was the... Uh, Safari Sally, uh, the rain is something which is very much important. And here I've got a story which involved the vendors and the other tribes in the province. We have got what is called the Rain Queen in Limpopo. 
And the rain queen is coming from a different type. It's not specifically from the vendors. But when we are celebrating or when we are performing the rituals for the rain, we all combine and we go there and play the traditional dances. I used to go there and I have been part of the people who danced for the rain before. So what we do there is that we go with those old traditional beers and the sniff and the talk uh, to the ancestors about the rain and just ask for the rain to come. And that is quite a very, very special event. Sometimes we even go to the a popular world heritage site called the Mapungube National Park, which is a national park in Limpopo, further north. There is where a national event it is, ta is taking place and all these kind of rituals are performed there sometimes. And so now let's go to Jamie, who has just arrived by the Haina Dan. There's not a single track on the ground, not a single fresh track, not a single track from before the rain, not a single track after the rain. Methinks they might have moved which we expected them to do. It was after that lion attack, I was actually surprised that they stayed as long as they did. No, I don't see a single fresh footprint here. Let me just sit for the briefest moment. Can you see the entrance from there, Sam? Yes. Cool, let's just sit for the briefest moment, just in case a cub does pop its head out, but I, I will be surprised, let me put it that way. Of course they've moved. Of course they have this afternoon. It was just thoroughly inevitable. I was so looking forward to just sitting here, sheltered from the rain. Okay. I'm almost certain of it. If we look closely at the ground outside the den, if we look down at the, at the soil around it, I don't see any sign of tracks. If we go a little bit down there, sends them to the right where they like to lie. There. That looks like the last time it was touched was when it rained. Rained at about three o'clock this morning. Heavily. I don't think they're here. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, we go and we check every other single known hyena den that they've used in the past until we find the one they're in. I'm personally hoping for Mvuvu Road because that is such a pretty den. Kirsty says I'm not allowed home until I do. Fair enough. Maybe I don't want to come home till I do. How about that? Okay. Kirsty says that's perfect because they don't want me back. We love each other really. No. Mm. Mm. Hold on. There's some tracks here. Actually, it looks like the dogs ran through here. Very faint. I can't really show you because it's... No, there's tracks here. There's tracks here. Hold on. Might be counting our chickens before they hatch. Or our hyena dens before they hatch. All right, well, we can't stay here anyway because the adults aren't here, so I might as well go and check the other dens just in case there's something we don't know about. Maybe June's had a cub or whatever it may be. Hart was hunting again this morning at Buffles Hook Dam. So they, they've really specialized in chasing the water buck or whatever it happens to be in this case. So far it's been, I think it's three water buck in a row that they've chased into that mud. So they've They've really figured out that this is the most effective hunting technique. Now, it won't work at any other time of the year. It won't work when there's lots of water in Buffles Hook Dam because the animal will just go further into the water. But when it's the sticky, sticky, thick mud, they chase them round and round until one makes the mistake of going into the water and then they grab it. Clever. It's really clever and it's obviously very effective because they've had three water buck kills there. 
so it's something that they've perfected. Alrighty. Hmm. Where to go? Which den to check first? I guess we go check in Bubble Road. Although Brent was going to go that side, so maybe he can check in Bubble Road for me and I'll check Aubrey's Road. Uh, there were some tracks there though. I think the adults are just not here. I was really hoping they were going to be there. Alright, speaking of a Mr. Leo Smith. He has had to return to camp to put his roof on. He has now accomplished that. Let's go back across to him. Thanks very much, Rex. Hello, hello. Well done on catching Kirsten. Well done, well done. But uh, we, we're now trying to find out where Tingana is. So I was just chatting to Rexon. So I'm going to see if we can get a vehicle in there. We might not be able to with the roof. It's about to get even wetter. I really don't like wet game drives. That's, I'm not a fan. I've done too many of them in my life. I escaped from the tent, but now I'm wishing I was in it with this weather. Oh, it's starting to actually rain quite hard. We might have to close up the sides. Let's see if we can find Tingana before we do that. No, Rex said I should try it from the power lines and then head down the drainage system. Heather's asking whether Tingana has been seen mating again. Uh, not that I'm aware of. We heard a leopard mating. It doesn't mean it was Tingana, but possible. I think if it was Tingana, he'd still be mating. Okay, we're going to have a quick look from here and then. We're going to move ourselves around, try to get in from that side. Um, no, I don't think we're going to be able to see anything from here. Oh, dearie, dearie me. So he's somewhere in this little river system in front of us. Okay. Let's try from up here. It's cold now. Okay, let's put it into low range because we are going to be off-roading. Okay, let us see. Maybe we'll get lucky. And with the, the roof on, we might be able to negotiate our way into this area. Now, the reason, oh, hello, scrub hair. I went for no roof this afternoon is because I was going looking for the wild dogs. And uh, sticking with wild dogs with a roof is near impossible. And a little scrubby sitting there. Is he behind the pole? No, he's not behind the pole. There we go. Off it hops. Yep, gone. Okay, I, I think I see a gap to get down to the edge of this river system. So with the roof, we can't sneak into spots that we might have been able to without a roof. Okay, now let's see if we can see the Duke of Duma. I'm hoping he is here, so the rain is getting hard enough that we're not going to be able to move too much without all the covers down, which is never ideal when one is on a game drive. Okay, he should be somewhere around right here. Where are the new rooms? New rooms are there. You got him? Yeah. Well done, batters. Whereabouts? Back slightly. Well done, Craig. Oh, there he is. Was oh, that Hosanna? I can't really see. No, it is Tingana. Uh, forward a bit. Um, 
<laughs> not in the best spot. I think that's about as good as it gets for now. The scarer of Kirsten. And uh, this is very nice to have a cat. But that's what Kirsten looks like when she sees a leopard. <laughs> okay, back. <laughs> we had to get it in properly. <laughs> this is a wonderful blackmail photo. And also, because Kirsten had no one else to go to, Jamie was closing down the covers, Sydney setting up in the tent, so she was stuck with only us. And we have a cat. And we are going to have to reposition Huatli um, and drop our covers as well. Because otherwise, Craig's going to get very wet. Craig, do you want to start maybe the back? The water is starting to come. Unfortunately, the rain is coming from directly behind us. So we'll just... Okay, we're going to drop our covers and sit here with Tingana. In the meantime, let's send you across to Jamie. Well done, Batman, for spotting Tingana. We are all deeply, deeply relieved because, as you can see, I said Batman, didn't I? Didn't I say Batman? I'm sure I said Batman. I said, well done, Batman, for spotting Tingana. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, cool. <laughs> so... That was hilarious. I will have to unplug my earpiece in order to put the flap back up, so just bear with me. Senzo can always tell me if okay. if Brent has managed to... I just said to Senzo, does this car not have a front flap? <laughs> Clearly it does. <laughs> You'll get to see my incredibly um, fancy sock set up as well. Ow! <laughs> I should have done that really slowly and dramatically, like a curtain rolling up, but I, then I would have had to stay in the rain for longer. Now, how do I make you stay there? Just, just do. Okay? Just stay. I've been sitting in one place because driving in this means that it comes, it, it really does come into the front. And if I put the front flap down, well, I can't drive. So, yeah. That was a superb, superb sense of timing from that front flap there. So we can have a look at the, the rain. It'll pass soon, actually. I really don't think it's going to set in for long. So we'll just wait it out a little bit. We can talk a bit about the savannah and the mixed bush felt woodland that you're looking at at the moment with the gentle, steady stream of rain. Rex did say to me, Jamie, there's something nasty coming. He was absolutely, not nasty, he said there's something big coming. He was absolutely correct, it is now raining properly. Now this is exactly the kind of rain that we want to see, because it is gentle and soaking. A downpour would take, there's so little ground cover in certain places, that it would take the topsoil right off and, and wash away all those valuable nutrients in that soil. So. Um, to have a heavy downpour would not be ideal. A nice gentle downpour that is constant throughout the night would be exactly what this area needs in order to recover from the dry season. So we've got all sorts of trees there. I mean, this is really enthralling stuff. We, I'm not getting out to go and get you branches. It's wet. That is a guari bush, always green, and very little wants to eat it. 
Ah, Betty would like to know about trees. Betty would like to know about a leadwood tree, the one tree that I cannot see. Now, Betty wants to know if a leadwood tree burns easily. And the answer to that is no. It is very difficult to set leadwood on fire or to get it to catch because it is very, very hard wood. So it is, it takes a long time to get going, but when it does, then it burns beautifully and very, very hot. So the marula tree that you can actually see in front of you on the left side of your screen, that is soft, soft, soft wood and is completely useless for firewood. If you were to go and collect that dead branch hanging off it now, that's probably about, well, it's actually hollow, so that really would be useless. In fact, I think there's probably a nest in there. That's probably a barbed hole or a woodpecker hole that they've made. Who knows what's inhabiting it now. Now if you were to burn that branch it would last all of maybe 15 minutes before it was burnt, to, burnt up. I have seen leadwood trees burning six weeks after a fire has gone through an area. So a big chunk of leadwood will burn all night. However, remember that leadwoods are protected and therefore cannot be chopped down for firewood. It is not illegal to pick up the dead branches around it though. So leadwood makes very, very good firewood. It burns for a long time. It's dense. One square meter of leadwood wood would weigh a ton. One square meter of leadwood wood would weigh a ton. Leadwood wood, yes. One square meter of leadwood wood would weigh a ton. Say that several times quickly. And it sinks, hence the name leadwood. So if you put it in water, it does not float. This came as a great surprise for those who cut down the leadwood trees in order to make them into railway sleepers because they cut down the trees and as they were accustomed to do they went to throw the wood into the river so they could wash it down to to other people and of course it went bloop to the bottom of the river not ideal I am clutching in my hand my next desperate source of content oh dear I turned him upside down sorry in the form of a chafer now, for South Africans out there, we would call this a Christmas beetle, which is a slightly flattened one. And you can even, if you look really closely, see the calluses on my hands. Oh, dear. Right, as enthralling as that was, let's go back across to Brent and his leopard. Yes, we have switched into infrared lights because it is very dark for this time of the day and of course that's just due to the weather. And uh, we are lucky enough to have a kitty cat with us, isn't that wonderful? So we are with Tingana, he's got an Inyala kill somewhere around here, probably in the drainage. Uh, if Tomorrow, if it's not raining and we don't have roofs on, we can probably get a bit closer. But for now, unfortunately, this is the the spot we are, are limited to. But it's better than no cats, is it not, everyone? Jim is wondering, do we ever get flash flooding? Um, occasionally we do, Jim. Uh, not too often, but it, it, we do occasionally get flash flooding. Uh, we were expecting flash flooding, when was it? A couple of years ago, while we were waiting for Steph's great deluge that never came. I've, and Steph had us filling sandbags and <laughs> all sorts. And uh, I think we had about eight mils. So not a great deluge at all. More like a small puddle. But yes, it is possible to have flash flooding. That so doesn't happen too often though. One real human is wondering which animals thrive in this miserable weather. Well, one that definitely comes to mind is uh, the froggies. The froggies are great fans of this weather.
but uh, elephants are quite fond of it. The big cats, if they don't have kills, they actually enjoy hunting in this weather. It is good hunting weather if you are a large kitty cat, such as a, a leopard or a lion. And of course, with this cool weather throughout the day, they tend to be a lot more active during the daytime hours. Uh, they don't have to hide from the heat. Certain bird species will also enjoy this weather, particularly if the termite alates start coming out. It is a, a, a feast for many species of birds. Tingana looks very comfortable there at the moment, a bit more comfortable than me. He's um, brightened up, I've got my shuka out, I've got my scarf on. I think I might even have to put on my second jersey quite soon because it is quite chilly. But for now we're quite happy to be stationary with Tingana. We don't know, maybe the hyenas will arrive. So our plan is to be right here for the rest of the evening. Now, of course, as I said, Tingana won't mind this weather too much, especially since he's got a nice big Inyala carcass there, which means the cool weather will make digesting that Inyala much, much better. We're not 100% sure whether he killed it or he found it. There are a lot of deaths at the moment, natural deaths, natural mortalities, which is not uncommon at this time of the year at the end of the dry season and quite a few of those mortalities uh, well most of the mortalities for that matter are with the browsers the browsers tend to have it a bit more tough now one of the reasons for this is because of their diet so a lot of different plant species have chemical defenses where they will release a lot of tannins which uh, can produce some acids and as a general rule when there's enough food around as soon as those plants produce that chemical defense they will move off and go feed in another area the problem at the moment is there just isn't that much to eat so that if they move to another area it's already been browsed and those plants are producing more tannins again and also of course, the quality of the food they're eating at the moment is not great, but hopefully this little bit of rain will definitely aid them in getting better food. Oh, he looked at us. Well done. Nico Nico is wondering, do animals catch colds? Yes, it is possible. Uh, the common cold is actually was actually spread to humans from birds. The common cold was an avian flu. So yes, animals can most definitely uh, catch a cold. Uh, birds more so than, than, than the mammals, but it is possible. You can hear the pitter-patter of raindrops on our roof. Fortunately, it's not raining as hard as it was a few minutes ago. You can start hearing some frogs. I'm gonna keep quiet for a few seconds so you can listen. Unfortunately, I think we're just going to pick up more of the roof than anything else, but we can give it a try. Oh dear, I can hear... It sounds like I can actually hear a bush felt rain frog. Now, 
The one thing I'm definitely not jealous of is Jamie, who's got to be moving in this weather. At least we've got a stationary cat, so we don't have to drive around. Let's go see what she's up to. Someday. He's always gracious, our Brenty, isn't he? Um, I'm not particularly a joy driving in this rain. But what we're going to do is we're going to have one quick check of this hyena den again. We haven't, we weren't parked far away from it. And I was just waiting till the worst part of that drizzle settled down a little bit. And now we're off once again. Oops, I've left my monitor uncovered. Now, while we drive in, apparently I have got something completely topsy-turvy. So thank you to Owen who let me know that apparently mustelids are not closely related to her pestids and viverids. Now, I would love to say that that was just a slip of the tongue, but I actually really genuinely thought that they were. I don't know where I got that from. I don't know why I thought that was the case. I don't know if I was taught that once or if I read it somewhere mistakenly, but apparently they're not. Apparently they're more closely related to the sort of the doggish side of the evolutionary tree rather than the mongooses and and cats. So, I'm sorry, I was talking nonsense. We do not lump mustelids closely together with the herpestids and the viverids. Remember we were talking about the genets and what they're related to? We don't lump them together. Now, my sincere apologies. I don't know where I got that from. I really honestly thought it was the case. It was, it was not misspoken. It was a genuine belief. Okie dokie. Since I do not see one single hyena here, let's go across to Sydney, who has found himself some shelter and is playing with skulls, apparently. I've got a very big head here. This animal, ew, this is very heavy. Uh, this is from the giraffe. You can see these uh, two oxycons here. Today we are very nice and close to the oxycons because mostly we do see these giraffes walking around. So now I want to easily distinguish the difference between these oxycons and the horns. So if you look here, you can see that there is no carotene at all around this. Not because this skull is old. The skull is old, yes, but uh, from the beginning there was never a keratin here. So the uh, horns are like this. If you look here, you will see that this part is consisted of the keratin. And this keratin is covering a bony structure inside. So this is what is called a horn. An oxycone is just the bones. And these bones are covered by a skin. And on top here is where you can easily distinguish between the male and the female. So, but here, by looking at this skull, I can tell that this was a male. Why I am saying so? Because if you look here, you will see that the oxycones are very much thick. And for the female, the oxycones are very thin. And the females, on top here of the oxycones, you will see the hairs. And males, you won't see the hairs. But now that the skull is um, completely dry and it's just a bone, you won't be able to see the hairs. So this is what is called an oxycone. Oxycone is consisted of a skin and a bone, whereas the horn is consisted of the um, keratin, as well as the bone. So now I've got something interesting again on these horns. You can see that here on the side of these horns, we have got a line of some of the protuberance coming down. So this is how the horns and the, all the materials consisted of keratins are decomposed from the hoofs to the horns. This is a certain insect. It's called a horn borer moth. Horn borer moth drills here and use their own droppings in order to develop this pro tuberins and they are inside here reason for them to to bring out this is to be able to hide in there when it's hot so this is how the horns are decomposed so you can see that in the bush there is a very interesting chain when the animal dies they get eaten by other animals and then you are going to have the other small things coming to do a decomposition so this was an impala. So now let's go to one of those animals who does catch the impalas.
<laughs> yes, indeed, Tingana is uh, fond of catching the odd impala. Now, we're only about 100 meters from Sydney. So, Sydney's in the tent, not too far from where we are at this very moment. And you can hear the rain is starting to fall quite a lot more heavily. Ah! Oh. Excellent question from Colleen. When was the first time I met Tingana? I think I think I saw him the first time I saw him on foot was actually quite a funny story. Uh, he was just moving into Juma. He'd been an Arethusa leopard up until then. And uh, found fresh leopard tracks around Treehouse Dam. And I walked and I found him on foot. And I went back to fetch the car. And I came back and he would had vanished. And I said, okay, I'm gonna have to go for another walk to try to find him, yada, 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 yada. And uh, I got out of the car, and as I linked away to James or Jamie, uh, there was a, my cameraman said, oh my goodness. He, he didn't actually say, oh my goodness, he said, he's right there. And literally he was standing, asleep, hiding under a log about a meter and a half from my legs. And uh, then obviously I jumped back in the car, gave him space, and he had a he had a diker kill in the tree. And uh, I think I have that one somewhere. But it is one of my favourite pictures of Tingana that I took many moons ago, and one of my first decent sightings of him. Let's see if I can find it for you. It was very, 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 very. I I really much no, I don't have it on this device, unfortunately. Maybe I do. Shannon is wondering, what is the funniest thing I've seen Tingana do? I'm not sure if I've seen him do too much funny stuff. I've seen him fall out of a tree once or twice. Well, not really fall out of a tree, but sort of stumble out of a tree. Um... Funny, what funny things have we seen Tingana do? I've seen him chase the odd hyena. It's not really funny though, is it? Our funniest leopard is definitely Hosanna. Quarantine also used to be quite funny. Kunyuma not so much, he was just quite snarly. Oh my goodness, the rain is starting to come down even harder now. And we'll hear that bit of pattering. Of course, the rain is very good for the bush. And uh, it's going to be great on bushwalk in, a, in 10 days or so. So all the bugs will be out and some flowers, which will be quite exciting. There you. And of course, the impala lambing season is pretty... I reckon there's some baby impalas somewhere. We just haven't seen any. But the impala lambing season should get full going in the next two weeks or so. Well, my day was wrong, well, for us to see one. I, I said it was going to be yesterday. And it's when we, I think it was the year before, whatnot, was the first um, pile of lambs were, were on the 7th, on Tristan's birthday. But alas, this year, I'm sure there's one out there, we just haven't been able to find it. Paul is wondering, will Tingana go patrolling and have to scent mark once the rain has stopped? He will, Paul, but he'll probably finish his Nyala first. There's no point in scent marking on an empty belly. So I think he'll finish this Nyala carcass before he heads off scent marking. Oh yeah. This weather is foul. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of rainy, rainy, rainy drives. I understand that we need the rain, but for me, I like being dry. I've spent my life, well, a, a, a large portion of my life at times being wet, having lived in rainforests, and, and when it rains there, you just gotta sit it out and don't sit under a big tree because they fall over in the rain because they all got very shallow root systems. You try to find small trees and you basically just hunker down and wait for the rain to stop before you can even walk home. So yeah, uh, you don't walk around in the rain in a rainforest because it is quite dangerous. You also can't hear uh, the elephants because all you can hear is the rain. I 
and as I say that we can carry it quite clearly at the moment. Pitter patter, pitter patter. Firebird is wondering if we get black leopards here. Uh, Firebird, it's possible, but quite unlikely. Uh, in, in the mountains to the northwest of here, well, more west than northwest, yeah, northwest, um, in Leidenberg, there's been quite a few black leopards recorded. Uh, I've only seen one in my life, and that was in northern Zululand. But it's possible, just highly unlikely. So it's a recessive gene. So as I say, it's possible but very unlikely. You also get leucistic leopards. I don't know of any recorded in this area, but in the north of South Africa, a place called Madikwe, there have been, well, they call them strawberry leopards, but they are leucistic leopards. And Tangana is, of course, neither of these things. I was about to call him a bog standard leopard, but he's not, is he? He's wonderful. A very dopey face, old Tingana. Okay, well, we're going to sit tight here and send you across to poor Jamie, who's still moving about in the rain. Oh, no, no, it's wonderful. I love being out here in the rain. It's fantastic. We are, of course, obliged to enjoy every minute of this at any one point in time, even when ice cold and slightly damp and with the roof dripping on my head every now and again, especially because it's dripping green water because it's been sitting up there for the last three weeks and has become full of algae. It's wonderful. I'm kidding. We'll find something. We'll find something to look at. James, you want to know if we've ever seen the drainage lines full of water? To a point, I have seen the Mulwati, which is the, the main drainage line or river system that runs through Juma. I've seen it flow once after Steph's Great Deluge, also known as the Cyclone... What was it called? Deneo. Deneo. After Cyclone Deneo, it, it flowed with a great raging torrent of about two inches worth of water but I have seen it flow. But most of the drainage lines, you'll find that they collect water in the corners, at the bends of the, the drainage lines. Now about four or five years ago, there was a massive flood. And it, I wasn't here at the time. I, I was working elsewhere, but not far from here. And every single drainage line was flowing and flooded. And I mean, it was flash floods, the grass, 10 meters above the bottom of the drainage lines was flattened for, at the sheer amount of water because the ground was so waterlogged that the, and the drainage lines were flowing so they would flood because all of this water would just flow through the soil and, and into the drainage lines themselves. And at one point we were completely trapped. At one point I couldn't get back to work. I was on leave. I mean, horrors. I couldn't get back to work. But I... We'd run out of tea, which was, was absolutely terrible. We had no tea. My friend Emma and I had no tea, and the only food that we had with us was bacon. And we were trapped for an extra two days where we were. We could not get out. I know, it was awful. Shocking. So many ways of cooking bacon that I never thought of before. Um, on a different subject entirely, the very first time I saw Tingana was on my job interview when he was still a leopard in the West and spending a lot more time on Arethusa's side before the disappearance of Mvula and I did not call him Tingana, I called him Tingata. I called him Tingata throughout my job interview as, as well as, I don't know why I thought his name would possibly have been Tingata and uh, thankfully Kirsty has, has played it on repeat for me in the past, Tingata. So that was the very first time I ever saw Tingana. It was right on the southern side of Arethusa. And Brent was driving because he did the first hour and a half. We only had one vehicle back in those days. And the night before, I'd been sitting on the back of Wendy to see how it all worked. And Wendy caught on fire. 
This was my job interview. Brent then drove the first hour and a half of the Sunrise Safari and I did the next hour and a half on my own. And then I did three hours on my own that afternoon. And I saw Tingata, also known as Tingana. I also saw the Stig Pride. The Stig Pride, I don't know, I think I assumed that they had named him after at the Top Gear character, the Stig Pride. The Stygian reference escaped me completely. I did not in any way associate them with the mythical river Styx upon which the souls of the de departed are transported to the afterlife. I did not make that connection. They were the Stig Pride. I also, it was Brent and Andrew was my cameraman. Oh, some of you will remember Andrew and he Brent went on the back of the vehicle of course he did you know some things are slightly more obvious in hindsight um, he went on the back of the vehicle with me and at one point I didn't know where I was I was just driving I was kind of just picking random routes they told me where Cheetah Cut Line was and that was it I just had to go and I wanted to get back to the Lions and Brent and Andrew both pointed in opposite directions as to where I should go. But remember, I was the only feed, so I was live the entire time. And one pointed there and one pointed there. And then they had a full-on fist fight in the back, trying to, to fight over who was right and which way I should go. And the rest, as they say, is history. I know, right? <laughs> Those were the sticks cubs. First ever sighting of the Stig's Cubs. Mr. Dyson was going on leave that day. The Stig Cubs, the very first sighting of the Stig Cubs, sorry. Mr. Scotty was going on leave and he, he went and found them that morning on tracking team. And the rain's getting harder, everyone. This is getting more and more pleasant, this trip down the soggy memory lane. <laughs> I found something, but it looks like a, some poor dazzled impala. The Wendy thing was funny though when it's caught on fire because I said to Brent as we got back, not knowing him at all, I, I think I can smell smoke. I really think I can. In fact, Brent, I can see smoke. At which point, Brent emptied an entire thing, fire extinguisher into the back, all over the equipment, all over everything. He had to. I mean, the, these are aluminium cars and they are petrol. And it was right, the fire was right next to the petrol tank. But at first he said to me, no, it's just the water pump that smells like burning. This was when we all lived at Manioletti as well. Ah, apparently you are all asking which direction I went in whether it was Brent's direction or Andrew's direction. I think it's fairly obvious. If Senzo says it's pretty obvious, <laughs> four years later, three and a half years later, we are, we, I took Brent the Brent direction. We're now engaged. But uh, you are, of course, talking actually physically which direction did I take. I, I don't remember. I, think I probably, let me, let me be honest, I probably took Brent's direction actually went the way he was pointing. Ah, memories. <laughs> oh, I like that. I'm going to steal Kirsten's link. Off we go across to Sydney to looking at more skulls and tortoise shells. I have got the leopard trotter here with me at the moment. A nice and close contact with the leopard trotter. So you can see that this leopard trotter has been here for quite some time. So, but there's something very interesting I want to share with you about this leopard trotter. I have seen people during the dry season, specifically in winter, if you come across the leopard trotter by a mistake, because I know by winter season, normally is when they're hibernating. But shortly before winter, you will see them when they're trying to grab the food, the last meal before they hibernate. These kind of uh, animals, they do store the water by a place called busa in the body. And when they're irritated, if you get off the vehicle 
and pick them up in order to put them on the other side of the road. I know you will be doing that, trying to help them, because you can see they are slow to cross the road. But on the other side, you will be putting them on high risk, because these kind of animals, if you drag them and you, you pick them up and put them on the other side of the road, what is going to happen is that it's going to retaliate by re secreting quite a lot of water from the booth, which is the water stored in order to serve the uh, tortoise during the dry season. So you can see that it's very much important to just stop the vehicle and let the tortoise cross the road rather than to pick him up because you will be helping and killing the tortoise at the same time. Yes, some of them can survive if there's quite a lot of water available in the area. But if the water is dry and the dry season is about to come and all the water has been stored long before that is when you'll be jeopardizing the life of these kind of beautiful animals. So, Rosalind, this is not uh, very heavy, uh, but it's very hard. This kind of animals has got a very interesting behavior, Rosalind. For this animal to develop the hard shell like this, let me just put my mic on the ground. When this animal, to, for this animal to develop a shell like this, they must have to do the following. They must have to go and look for the droppings. Droppings of the animals such as the giraffes and the droppings of the animals that eat meat, such as the hyenas, which crush the bones. They must eat those kind of droppings so that they can get the calcium in order to solidify this uh, outer layer. So that's why today this is very strong. As a result of the calcium, this kind of animal is getting from the droppings of the other animal, which is termed a caprophagic behavior. So you can see that in the bush, nothing is wasted. When the animals are defecating, they are manufacture animals are eating and manufacturing food for the animals to eat in the form of droppings. Uh, Nico, Nico, uh, this was not eaten. The thing is, it's getting old. Because it's getting old here by the storeroom, every time it's aging, it falls sometimes. You can see some other pieces are coming. But let me just check nicely here. No, there is no sign of any problem here. And something interesting is that the leopard turtle is one of the turtles which cannot swim. So this kind of turtle cannot swim. And it's lack of a nuchal shield. It doesn't smell. So, but you have to be careful because uh, these kind of uh, tortoise, they have got very sharp edges on the side of the mouth. So it's, the mouth is like a bed. So you see the bed beak, it doesn't have teeth. So it only have, uh, the, uh, it only have the sharp edges in order to catch the grasses. So they eat a lot of uh, grasses. So now uh, let's go back to Brent, who's got Tingana. Well, we had Tingana. Oh no, he's just moved a little bit behind a tree as the rain's got harder. And I'm just gonna try reverse, see if we can find him again. Oh, okay. reversing with the covers on is not the most fun thing. And in this darkness, Oh, don't rain, don't fall on me, water. Oh, it's miserable. <laughs> Look at that, all this water pouring off the roof. I'm just going to wait for it to flow off before I move. Otherwise, that'll fall onto me. Okay. I'm gonna see where I came in here. Well, no, I can't see where I'm reversing, which is obviously a bit of a problem. Oh dear, my backlight's not working either. Okay, let's 
Let's see if I can get out of here now. A bit of a hole there. No, we're not going to make it. I'm going to have to turn around. Unfortunately, reversing blind off-road through thick bush is just not going to work. But now, the one problem is, oh, gathering water quickly. This is proper rain now. This is soaking rain. Oh dearie me, I now have to face into it. Okay, well I try to get a view of Tingana. Let's go across to Sydney, who's happy and warm and dry in the tent. So I've got the uh, porcupine quill right here on my mic. And this porcupine, I want to tell you a story about them. You know, the porcupine quills, they are very much important. Some of the diseases we are treating uh, traditionally, in order to cut, in order to cut the skin so that we can inject them in the skin as medicine, we don't only use the sharp objects. Some of these ingredients traditionally has to be done, make use of a porcupine kill in order to cure the certain diseases. But if you use any other sharp object and you can put the ingredients, but it's not going to work, there are those which need specifically a certain uh, things such as a quill in order to assist. So some of us, there where I come from in Venda, they are so strong and these guys are those that go and participate mostly on those kind of sport activities in the form of boxing. Those ones, if you look at them, some of them here, you will see them with a big belt. And that belt is a, a belief that this guy, is, it gives him power in order to fight against others. So some of them, you won't see the belt, but they do get injected some of the ingredients from the plants, the plant's ingredients. Plants such as the sickle bush. Sickle bush has got a very hard skin and it has got a very strong stem. That stem, it's one of those stems which is believed uh, in order to be used as one of the ingredients in order to solidify the bones and bring the strength to someone when going for the fight. This quill is very much strong. Anna Marie, the porcupine, the quill, this one is not a symbol of a, a good luck, but yes, there are some of the animals that when you see them, it's a symbol of a good luck. But some of them, animals, if you see them, can be bad symbols. And some of the rare animals, animals that you don't see very often, if you see it like a pangolin, for example, if you see a pangolin, this is what is going to happen. Uh, if you tell them home, I saw a pangolin today, they will tell you, if you are on grade 12, grade 12, I'm talking about standard 10, writing exams, they will predict, make use of uh, the animal you saw that you are going to pass at school and some of them they dreams these kind of uh, things they come true <laughs> from what they saw they can interpret what is going to happen tomorrow on something and if they are going for interviews after seeing a preoccupa after seeing the pongolin they will tell you that uh, your interview is going to go very well because you saw that animal is a good luck animal and that is going to happen so now that is raining outside there I can tell you a story related to the pangolin. If you take the, 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 the skin of the pangolin, you just have to put it in a cup and you mix with water and drink. That it can be used as a, uh, like a flu vaccine in order to prevent the flu before it comes. So the youngsters, when they're still young, coming to winter season and when it's raining, we give them those things and then they have to drink. That is going to protect them against this kind of flus. And so now let's go back to Brent with Chingana.
Well, it's not in much better of a spot. It's definitely a worse spot for me because the rain is coming in where we have to park to see him. But again, this is Tingana. And he's just snoozing. He's probably got a nice full belly. I think he's probably not enjoying this rain too much though. This is a little bit too wet. But the frogs are certainly enjoying it. You're starting to hear quite a few of them. I heard a bushveld rain frog a little bit earlier. Which is awesome. They're like grumpy old men when you look at them. At the funniest faces. The Bushveld rain frog. And I know we're not going to be able to hear them because of the roof unless... Oh dear. That is very strange. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. I thought I would need to rectify that. My frog app is not on my iPad, only on my phone. Anyway, we shall play the Bushveld rain frog from the phone. So they've been estivating. So they've dug themselves a nice little hole somewhere and they've been waiting for the rain and now they've come out. You can have a look at what he looks like. Well, I say he looks like a grumpy old man. Mm, grumpy old man, the bushveld rain frog. He look morbid. Looks very grumpy. Briviceps at Aspersus. So, a very grumpy old man, the bushveld rain frog. The other frogs we can hear at the moment is some of the toads. And the eastern olive toad. That's what Kirsten sounds like in our ears. Wah, wah, wah. Oh no, no rain. Oh no, I need to move. I'm getting drenched here. Um, Take Care is wondering, do frog skins have some sort of cells that repel rain? No, not that I'm aware of. I'm just going to try a different angle here because um, we're getting really, really wet. Uh, yes, thank you, Craig. You're dry. I'm not dry. And this big jacket will take a long time to dry if it gets too wet. Let's see, can we get them through there? Out the side, yeah. Let me try this. Let's try and move into a position where the water's not coming in to the car. What's that, Craig? Yeah, well, we try to find a spot where we can see Tingana. Let's send you across to Jamie, who's still looking for lions. I'm not. I haven't been looking for lions since I heard that they were in Buffelzook. I'm definitely not looking for lions, I don't think. Well, you never know, actually. I might. No, I'm not looking for lions. Let me be honest. There is absolutely no part of me that is in any way looking for lions. I'm sitting still. Now, Gary, you want to know if this rain will cause the flowers to bloom. Potentially, yes, but it's not just the rain. It's also, so for, for those flowers, for the, for the annuals and for even the, for the perennial plants, they obviously go through these life cycles where they will bloom and grow during the wet season. Now, the wet season has now officially started. We're in November, and that also coincides with day length. So it's not just to do with the amount of water that's in the soil or the amount of rain that is around. It's also to do with what time of the year it is and, and how long the days are. And once what we'll start to see is with this rain and with the lengthening days, we should start to see the odd flower coming through. Most of them will start to come through later 
in the wet season. So certain things like the zinnias and the morning glories, you might see a few zinnias now. Um, the Oh, I'm rusty. What are those flowers called? They're pretty and white and there's lots of them and they're named after stars. Oh, good grief. The star thingies. Um, star flowers, we'll go with that. So they will, we will start to see flowers in a little bit, but the main bloom of the flowers will be later in the rainy season. So something that we can look forward to. Uh, the flowers are always very, very pretty. I'm not a flower person myself. Personally, I prefer trees. I much, much prefer trees, but I can appreciate them and I can appreciate the beauty of them as they come out. I do, it's not that I don't like flowers. It's just, I prefer trees. I can see, why am I seeing flashing? You've seen flashing too. That's weird, is it my headlight? I think it might be my headlights. I think my headlights are just really sad. No, I think it's the headlights. I shouldn't actually be sitting with them on. Colleen? That's a, that's a cool question from Colleen, and I think that it's a tricky one to answer, but Colleen wants to know, what's the first animal that got me fascinated with this sort of thing? I would say, I can not only say the species, I can say the name of the animal. His name was Buana, and Buana was a black rhino who was rescued in the Waterberg after his mother was poached, and I was allowed to hand feed him when I was eight years old. And it was Buana that really, really uh, put the idea in my head that I wanted to work in the wilderness for the entire time. Now, I want to be... <laughs> so apparently Kirsty's reading that book. I assume she's reading the Clive Walker book. I, I actually I have a signed I got a signed copy of Clive Walker's Field Guide when I was eight years old and it was my most treasured possession. And in one of the moves it's gone missing, but I I have a signed edition of his field guide. I knew it backwards by the time I was nine years old. Now my brother had just been born, so he was tiny, tiny. I think he was only a few weeks old when we took him to the bush that time. And I just, I was loving every moment of what I was seeing. So I think it was around about then. I wanted to be a vet from apparently when I was two years old. Apparently I sat up in bed and told my mom I was going to be a vet. And I really wanted to right up until forever. Uh, but I thought I was going to be James Herriot. Who I thought I was going to be working for some reason I, I assumed I was going to be helping cows give birth in the middle of the night in a cold Yorkshire moor because that was my sole experience of what being a vet was when I was little and learning to read and given those books to read so and then it was and then it was Buana that really did it for me the black rhino so there you go obviously I still had a fascination with all other things and then my Obsession with hyenas started a little bit later in life. I've always loved hyenas. I think that was even a question I was asked in my interview drive, was what was my favorite predator? And I said hyenas, not realizing at the time that that was going to inspire great ire from some people who really didn't like hyenas. I suppose I should pick up the spotlight and shine it around a few times. Hank, you say what a change from vet to law to safari guide. I knew I was coming back to be a safari guide when I studied law. When I was 17, I very sadly let myself get talked out of being a vet. I was told I couldn't do it because I was allergic to animals. I think I actually would have managed. I think I would have just survived. I would have been constantly stuffy nose, but I mean, there are worse things. But unfortunately, the vet school didn't take you in South Africa. There's only one really good one, and they don't take you if you're allergic to animals. So, yes, then I did law for numerous reasons, and then I knew I was coming back to this. I'd actually started working in the bush before I went and did my law degree. So I went and worked in the, in the Kalahari on Swalu, and then I came back straight away the moment I finished my degree. Yeah, Law and I... Yeah. Thank you. Heliotropium GDH, thank you. The string of stars. I knew there was a star in there somewhere. I just... I just it's been a long time since I've thought about those flowers. A really, really long time. I'm having flashbacks to the Mara now. 
I know this is incredibly entertaining, but I, uh, the more I drive, the, the, the more water collects all over the equipment in the front here. We haven't got anything. I'm not going to keep driving around in the dark till we just soak everything through. So we're just listening to the pitter-patter of the rain on the roof. Also, I know that the further north I go, the further I have to drive back straight into the rain south going home. So I really am sort of, I, I'm restricted with which direction I can go in. All right, as we continue to wait out of the rain, elef elephant Sydney is having some fun with elephant dung. So I've got the skull here, and this skull, I'm sure it does confuse quite a lot of uh, people because it looks like a buffalo, at the same time looks like a blue wildebeest, at the same time looks like a black wildebeest, so, but it's one between the blue and the black wildebeest. So here comes the difference between the blue and the black wildebeest. The blue wildebeest, it has got the large mane. Black wildebeest has got the small mane. And the blue wildebeest has got hairs here on the throat only. The black wildebeest has got hairs on the throat and on the thorax. The blue wildebeest, the horns are facing inwards. Black wildebeest, the horns are facing frontwards and upwards. So this is the blue wildebeest. And a lot of people I know, they do have a little bit of a confusion when coming to those two completely different species. So the wildebeest, a lot of them are dying because of a disease. This disease affects them here. So there is some of the insects, it's called a bot fly. A bot fly lays their eggs in the nose and the larva can pass through and go up here and get to the brain. And when the larva get to the brain, it disturbs the sense of balance. As a result of that, you will see the wildebeest turning, turning, get exhausted, falls over and dies. The illness is called a turning disease. So in Africa, in South Africa specifically, they also call it in Africans, they call it a snock sicter, which means a turning disease. That is why you will hear the wildebeest every time doing things such as... <clears throat> <clears throat> that is when it's trying to get rid of the parasite. So if you go to the area where the bird flies are uh, occurring, you have to be very careful. The bird flies, they have been recorded entering this part. They have been recorded entering this part. If the bird fly lay the egg right here by the corner of your eye, it has been recorded that these people who have been affected because of the worm, that worm is so thin in such a way that it can even be able to penetrate your people inside. And if that worm is in the eye, this is what is going to happen. When going for consultation, the doctor is going to take a laser and is going to shoot right into your eye with the laser in order to kill the, with the worm from the light. So you can see that the areas where those insects are occurring can be very much dangerous to us. So you must ask and avoid those areas. Otherwise, you must have to protect yourself from those kind of insects. <laughs> this elephant microphone is one of the very light micro I'm sure this is even much lighter than the normal microphone because now they doesn't have water. When the elephant droppings are dry, they are very much light. It doesn't have any water at all. When there's water, when it's wet, is when it can be very heavy. And because it's dry, it doesn't attract any insect, nothing. So, and no smell at all. <laughs> It doesn't have any smell, nothing. I'm just enjoying it. It rained a little bit while we were outside. It got wet a little bit, but still, I cannot pick up any kind of a smell. And I can't wait for that smell because it is a medicinally used smell. So I don't have to avoid it. 
So now uh, let's go back to uh, Tingana with Brent and see what Tingana is thinking this afternoon. Well, he's having a drink off his own skin at the moment. That is what he is doing. He is licking the water off his fur. Hey, big boy. Psych Diva, who's a new viewer, welcome, welcome. Um, Psych Diva would like to know, are Hosanna and Tingana the only leopards found in the area? No. We've got Tandi, Tlailamba, Shidulu, uh, Hukamuri, and then we've got some unrelaxed, unnamed females from the north. Uh, quarantine in Kanyeni, another two in the east. But that's about it. I think in my time here on Juma, I've seen over 27 different leopards. Some of them stay, some of them move along. I was actually working out one of these days how many different leopards I've seen here. He doesn't have to go anywhere to get a drink tonight. Looks like he might be getting ready to move back into the drainage system where his carcass is. As he licks, 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 licks himself. Mac is asking what does do I think Hosanna and Tingana think about humans following them around all day. Mac, I really don't think they're too perturbed by it at all. Um, the vehicles they don't really see as humans, uh, they see the vehicles as vehicles and they don't have an instinctive response. Hosanna, a bit different on foot, he's very relaxed. Tingana, not so much. But I don't think they are too perturbed and don't really think too much about it at all. Now, the fun part about this is, even though we're very close to camp, negotiating our way out of this thicket in the dark with the roof on is going to be lots of fun. We're not as adept at moving around as Tingana. Chad is wondering, what is the furthest I've seen a leopard travel? Well, I, the furthest I know of a leopard traveling is, is close on 800 kilometers. There were young males that were collared in northern Zululand and they ended up in Kruger. So they crossed Swaziland. They, they, so that is the furthest I've, I've ever heard of a leopard traveling. Oh, and the rain's getting harder again. We actually thought it was going to rain more like this last night, but it was more wind than anything last night, but this is proper soaking rain. I wonder how much we're going to have overnight. Maybe 20 mils if we're lucky. Sana, what do you think? Oh, he's not a Sana Tingana, what do you think? She, he thinks Kirsten's a knick-knack. That's what he thinks. Miss Kirsten gave him a big fright today <laughs> when she popped her head out of her, out of her door. And Kirsten's trying to claim she's become best friends with Tingana and he was saying hello. Well, he was saying hello by running away from you, Kirsten. He saw that red hair and he thought, yo, 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 that thing's evil, I need to get out of here fast. Now Kirsten's saying, at least I'm in a nice warm final control. Yes, Kirsten, I'm going to go put a bucket of water in your bed so you can feel how I feel now. The whole one side of me is wet. I can actually splashes. Miss Alamander says Brent should do all the rain drives. No, 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 no. Brent doesn't like rain drives. They're horrible. Brent's happy in the tent when it's raining. 
Right, we're going to say goodbye from a very wet Juma Private Game Reserve in the northern Sabi Sands on the western edge of Kruger, on the eastern edge of South Africa, in the province of Mpumalanga, which means where the sun rises, not far from the border of Mozambique in the southern most country in Africa, the beautiful and gorgeous South Africa. It would just be a bit nicer if we had non-redheads talking to us all drive and being mean. Just Kirsten's so mean. And that is what we'll take from this drive, that Kirsten is mean and Tingana is wet. <laughs> Goodbye!